Hello, friends. Um, welcome to the 2017 Global Dialogue on Waste. Um, since 2013, we've been making uh, high quality knowledge easily accessible and consumable to leaders anywhere in the world. And um, for us, the qualification to be a leader um, was anyone being able to take a step towards finding solutions to and through waste. And um, for us, a leader doesn't have to be someone with a leadership position, but anywhere. Uh, anyone, anywhere in the world, belonging to any community and at any point in their lives and professions uh, can be a leader. No single community or person has a monopoly on leadership and all you need to be, um, all you need is to be able to wish to make change. Um, if not for our work, most of this information would have uh, stayed immobilized or landfilled and lengthy PDFs or uh, would have been expensive international conferences. So um, we are extremely happy about the impact we've been creating, but um, this is just a drop in the ocean compared uh, to the scale of challenges we face, which are all planetary. We have our uh, battles to fight. We will have uh, many heroes, successes, and failures. So I request you to get ready to lead and take the next step towards improving life on our precious pale blue dot. For those who are not ready yet, um, take your time. And uh, when you're ready, we'll be here to help and guide you take the next step and I'll be here to help in any other way possible. Um, in addition to the global dialogue on waste, Be Waste Wise also uh, publishes uh, uh, a waste pioneers list. Uh, it's a list of uh, 30 organizations and 30 individuals worldwide who are doing uh, an amazing job of sharing their story or sharing solutions using social media. And once the list is published, we also organize Q&A sessions with the pioneers and we're also planning an interview series, a weekly interview series with individual pioneers. So uh, check them out, um, follow us on um, social media, and also uh, subscribe to our monthly newsletter to stay updated. In addition to all of this, we also have a community newsletter. So if you've ever been a contributor to Be Waste Wise, uh, or if you've been an author or um, panelist on Be Waste Wise, you could send your um, uh, updates your work achievements or uh, any new articles that you've written to be waste wise and then we will share them uh, with our community on the newsletter and also on our social media um, and uh, this year we have about uh, 330 registrations for this event so I'm really happy and about this and th thank you for your support um, greatly appreciate it and uh, finally um, um, I've been um, actively seeking employment, and while I was doing that, I realized that there is no single platform or um, single place on the internet for uh, people in the waste management sector to find good jobs. Um, so, uh, you know, um, just another drop in the ocean, but uh, we will be uh, putting together uh, jobs from around the world and uh, posting them on our LinkedIn group and also on our uh, social media um, channels. So if you have any uh, job opportunities with you, send it to us. You can find, you know, access to better talent. You can get access to better talent and everyone else will have a place to go to when, when they need, uh, when they're in search of jobs. Um, and in today's theme, we'll discuss, uh, coming to today's theme, collective action. We will discuss how uh, all of us can act collectively to address the planetary scale challenges we face today. Um, uh, they can only, I mean, these challenges are planetary, but the solutions are all local. So they cannot be um, solved by one organization or one person doing something. All of us have to act collectively, take a step forward um, and um, towards a common goal. So um, to, to uh, discuss all of this, uh, first we have uh, uh, Olivia Lapierre and uh, Chanel Crosby. Uh, both of them are ambassadors at uh, B0 and uh, they'll be talking about uh, why or and or how we can make environmental movements more inclusive and diverse so that we can act collectively. Then we have uh, another Olivia and Carter Rice, uh, co-founders of uh, One More Generation, talk about how they engage public with their campaigns. And then uh, Madison Gitlin from Global Green will talk about their ambassador program to engage apartment buildings in recycling. And then we have uh, Chris Kane from Post Landfill Action Network. Uh, he'll take us through their manual for plastic-free campuses. And finally, we have Marcus Erickson talk about his book, Junkraft, uh, uh, Ocean Voyage and a 
uh, Rising Tide of Activism Against Plastic Pollution. That's the name of the book. Uh, about the book and he'll also tell us about his experiences from bali indonesia where he currently is for a uh, global meeting um first let's start with um olivia and um, chanel chanel uh, is unable to join us through video but we have her on our audio stream and uh, we also have uh, olivia here um olivia and chanel welcome to the 2017 global dialogue on this hi thank you hi thank you Thanks, great. So, um, Olivia, could you uh, um, tell us a little bit about um, how you got involved in this movement and, you know, why you think um, environmental movements are not more diverse? Yeah, um, so uh, I got involved in the zero waste movement uh, because my partner stumbled upon some zero waste bloggers online and then shared it with me because um, he knew I had been really engaged in climate activism within our community. Uh, and he thought that this would, uh, and basically he thought this would be a cool project for us to do. And so I tried it out. Um, I mean, not try it out, but like I'm still doing it. And um, I really enjoyed living zero waste. Um, it's so different from other climate activism um, for me because it feels that I'm not like, for me, I was just like harassing people to like reduce their trash and um, and their plastic intake, but not really doing anything in my life. So it, it's holding me more accountable in the things that I'm um, projecting out in the world as far as climate activism. Um, and I think, I mean, there's several reasons why. I, I, I think it's not a lack of... I think it's both a lack of people of color in climate activism, but also a lack of recognition for the people that are in climate activism um, for several reasons, white supremacy, systemic racism, institutionalized racism, structural racism. Um, and um, it's not really focusing, it's not really about their capacity to be professionals or activists within these spaces, um, but not having a sense of belonging. Right. Um, Chanel, um, could you respond to the same question? You know, how did you get involved and um, why do you think there aren't more uh, people of color in um, environmental movements and uh, what, why you think uh, it's not more diverse? Sure. Um, so I, I came into the zero waste world um, through meeting Andrea, the founder of B Zero, a couple years ago. And um, we met and just started talking about kind of having too much stuff and things like that. So I didn't approach it directly into zero waste. Zero waste was sort of an evolving practice for me. So I was downsizing stuff and then I started to think about how I was eating. So that changed how I was grocery shopping. And so I started to stay to the outside of the store and then realized that things are wrapped in plastic more so towards the middle and of the grocery store. And so having those conversations with Andrea really shed light on what a zero waste economy is for me, is in general, and how I could participate in reducing my own personal plastic consumption. And from there, um, learning more and getting more involved in the zero waste industry and seeing that there is a lack of representation and um, why there's a lack of representation, I think, what Olivia said is is fantastic and spot on. So I I don't want to overlap that and, and also just highlight the fact that I think it's representation would be one of the hugest pieces. And so the representation ongoing and um, the decentralization of the current structures and support in that way. So I, we see people of color and what they've been doing for years and support that. All right. Um... All right, so um, when um, the two of you um, talk about the subject to someone new, um, what are some initial reactions or frequently asked questions? And um, how do you generally respond to them? Can you give us some examples on what kind of questions or responses you get? Um, either one of you can go first. Um, one that I typically hear often is like people saying, um, I could never do this because of like X, Y, and Z. I have a busy life. I have two jobs and kids, or um, I just have a lot going on, various reasons. Um, to which I respond, um, you know, 
like encouraging them it's like just about being intentional and being aware rather than trying to be perfect about this um and really trying to stay away from terms like zero waste and um and highlight on terms like low waste so like um yeah and then because often i think zero waste is um mis leading because it's not talking about producing no waste but referring to that industrial term um in addition to i try to never give any unsolicited advice to those people um and really let wait for them to take um leader like to be the leader of that conversation and so if they ask questions um i respond in the most empathetic way in which like i'm recognizing that different forms of oppression um, might be the reason why um, they're not able to be as engaged in climate activism. Mm -hmm. um, so now, uh, do you um, get similar questions and um, do you have similar experiences? Yes, absolutely. I think a lot of it, um, when you first step into it, whatever your exposure is, whether it's social media or another form of introduction, it can feel overwhelming as we apply zero waste, especially because it can make people who are just getting started or um, feel like they're not doing enough ever. And so um, similar to Olivia, if, if people ask me, then I, I love to share just small things that you can take for first steps, like reducing plastic bag use, um, refusing straws, and um, bringing around a reusable cup. And so a lot of times like that reusable cup can be an old salsa jar, for example, that you rinse out and now you have a jar and you already had that product in your shelf and didn't realize that it could also be used for something else later. So really just kind, kind of building that awareness and seeing how we can repurpose what we have, like what we already have access to and starting with that really simply. And um, since you're talking about um, repurposing what we have, um, uh, in our test run, we discussed this a little bit um, about how um, these days um, being zero waste or um, being in the circular economy means um, you buy new stuff to replace the old stuff. Um, so could you talk about that uh, on how th that probably is not zero waste? Sure. Yes, of course. And so um, through that process, if we if we see, you know, people that have been living a zero waste lifestyle for a long time and they have access to all the jars that they've collected maybe incrementally over shorter periods or maybe they did have a lot of money that they wanted to invest up front and they they completely overhauled say the kitchen or the bathroom at once well we like to talk about how that's that's not as supportive because then you're throwing away what you already had access to and then just replacing it so in that process of becoming closer to a zero waste or trash light living then you're actually creating more waste and so um like encouraging people if you have your favorite toothpaste right now but it happens to come in plastic but you have a whole tube you know this is a really small example you just finishing the tube and then and then looking into maybe making your own toothpaste later after that or other options. But um, but really that's that incremental small, it's, you know, I like to think of it as a marathon, not a sprint. Okay. And um, Olivia, could you um, tell us, uh, I mean, uh, we, uh, the three of us got in touch um, through the Loma article um, that, that you've written. Um, and I hear that you've uh, gotten really good um, response to it. So congratulations on that. And um, so could you talk a little bit about the difference between environmental racism, gentrification, and the zero waste movement? I mean, this is something that you mentioned in the article. But uh, before you do that, let me just um, remind our viewers that um, so we have um, Chanel Crosby and Olivia Lapierre with us today uh, from B0. And um, if you have any questions or comments that you'd like to be answered, uh, please use the Q&A box below the um, screen. You can use it to submit the question and then, you know, depending on how many questions we have, we have about uh, at least 15 minutes for the uh, panelists to respond. So, yeah, Olivia, could you tell us a little bit about the difference between those three, uh, racism, environmental racism, gentrification, and the zero waste movement? Um, yeah, I think there's, I mean, when I think of those three things, I don't think of, like, any differences. I see them all being so totally connected. Um, when I think gentrification, I'm thinking of um, communities um, that of color, um, housing costs 
rising because of various reasons. And recently I've been doing some research on how um, urban agriculture and different sustainability initiatives coming into communities of color um, and cleaning those, cleaning those communities up um, has been pushing the people of color or um, lower income people out of their neighborhoods. Um, in addition to, I think about how um, sustainability has as a whole been gentrified in which, um, again, we're talking about like this buy-in culture um, and that excludes lower income people and a variety of other people um, into the conversation. And so basically um, giving the message that like if you're poor, if you're a person of color or um, other or marginalized in some way, that you don't deserve to live in safe neighborhoods, that you can't afford to live in safe neighborhoods, that those aren't, they're not making them clean or safe for you. Um, I just wanna pull up this quote from Where Your Voice Mags, that, uh, Where Your Voice Mag, which is an intersectional feminist magazine based out of Oakland, um, in which they define environmental racism so beautifully. Um, so environmental racism is the disproportionate impact of environmental hazards of people of color. The air we breathe, the water we drink, even the neighborhoods we end up living in, um, living in are controlled by policies and practices. Redlining and housing discrimination of the 21st, 20th century is responsible for segregating people of color into the least desirable neighborhoods. 50% of people who live near hazardous waste are people of color. And flood, uh, flood plains throughout the country have a high black and Latinx population. Additionally, black children are twice as likely to suffer from lead poisoning as white children. And a big example of that is like Flint, um, Flint water crisis. So I'm like thinking, I, I think of like policies and structures um, uh, for that prohibit people of color from, you know, living in safe neighborhoods, but also, um, you know, not making them feel like they have a space to um, do anything about it. Right. And um, Chanel, so um, these impacts um, for someone like me who hasn't been, um, who, who's not uh, very involved or, or do not know much about um, environmental racism, um, it, it feels like, um, from my perspective, it feels like it's a combination of poverty and um, racism uh, that, you know, we have these kind of impacts on um, people of color. Um, what are your thoughts on it? Uh, am I right to think about it that way? Or, you know, what else should I know about? Yes, definitely. Um, I mean, I see them, I see the environmental racism, gentrification, and, and zero waste movement as a solution. It's all intersectional to me as well. And, um, and really being able to draw those lines between, so now, now I feel like with gentrification, we're experiencing the reverse of white flight. And so we're seeing people from the suburban areas come into urban areas where it's closer to things like light rails and jobs in downtown. And so they're tearing down older structures and smaller homes and replacing them with condos to absorb that influx of people from suburban areas. And so, um, so we saw, you know, we saw that a few, you know, what, a couple, 20, 30 years ago, and now we're seeing the reverse of that now. So there's more, even more uprooting happening and, and displacement. And so seeing that the zero waste movement as a solution for these things um, with representation of communities of color to offset and, and, um, you know, support resolution for those environmental hazards and shutting them down um, providing safer, healthier neighborhoods and places to live. And the awareness, I think, is key. Um, so um, I don't um, completely understand, you know, the connection between zero waste movement and maybe gentrification. Mm. Um, they do seem like um, quite different topics to me. So uh, how do you form the connection? Um, uh, how they connected? Sure. Yeah, I think that... Um, as we see, um, we'll use the condo example just because it's it's the biggest. And I think that as I've been traveling, I've seen it in a lot of different cities. Uh -huh. And so, for example, um, tearing down structures in place and displacing people. So thinking about the zero waste perspective, not just from plastic consumption and the reduction of that, but also from a holistic approach, thinking of people. And so we don't want to we don't want to like 
waste, quote unquote, people. And so what we're doing instead of supporting and, and providing resources to those in place communities and structures is displacing them. So there's there's a waste there. But then there's also the environmental racism and the and the things that we know about those communities um, and then the environmental lack of support that's given there. So so I see those two opportunities as a way to support. So an example of that um, would be like pipelines, landfills, incinerators, things like that. Um, so with the environmental racism work. And so the condos are an example of the superficial, like what we can see happening with gentrification, the visual of it. And then I think underneath that is the environmental racism and the systemic things that happen to displace people and and provide support and healthy living for certain you know, it's class as well. So um, really seeing the zero waste movement as a way for us to open up these conversations and make the environmental justice work, the climate justice work, and the zero waste work all intersectional and and connected. So that way we have more strength in, in campaigns and movements. And um, I think that they would be more successful that way. Right. I'd also like to add that um, a lot of the leaders of the zero waste movement um, are living in highly gentrified neighborhoods like Brooklyn, um, which begs the question, who has accessibility and resources to be even able to be in this, um, to, to be a participant within this movement? So like I can't connect with someone who's living in a very gentrified neighborhood, like for example, Brooklyn, because like that's just not like, I could never afford to live there. I don't have those resources in my community. Um, it makes me feel like only people within those gentrified areas um, are able to participate in um, in uh, sustainable uh, sustainability initiatives, which already feel like a very gentrified, um, whatever movement it may be within that realm, feel gentrified anyways. Yes. Right. And um, this was a conversation uh, we were having um, earlier this year with um, um, Julie Kearns from uh, Shop Junket. Uh, she's from Minneapolis and um, she runs a zero waste store. And um, this was a similar conversation. So um, we were asking about how what she thinks about being, you know, zero waste in a community which is, um, uh, you know, which is high income. Uh, in Minneapolis, you know, living on the river, uh, on the riverside, and um, uh, so it's it, 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 that's a good conversation that we've had earlier on a similar topic. So I would, um, you know, recommend um, viewers to um, look for the 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 interview with uh, Julie Kearns um, and um, get more more knowledge about the subject. Um, so um, Olivia, and uh, going back to the article again, the article that you wrote. Um, in, in, in that article, you say, uh, you say that the current zero waste or circular economy movements are extreme, elitist, and superficial. So, you know, what do you mean by that? And uh, if they are not ideal, you know, what's, your, what's your vision for the future of our world? That the, oh, that the zero waste or circular economy movements are extreme. Um, again, like uh, resources are not made accessible um, to um, lower income people, to people of color. So, for example, um, the zero waste stores being in gentrified neighborhoods um, and which and then selling products that um, that are ex extremely expensive. So, like, for example, when I first started zero waste, I like bought that very um like stereotypical zero waste kit with the tiffin and all of the like the bamboo utensils and whatnot and that was like over it was like a hundred something dollars just to be able to be um to feel confident and that I belong within this movement um that I needed those tools um in addition to I think not talking about give us some um, examples, Olivia can you give huh? us some examples so that you know we understand what you're talking about like what kind of tools or what did you okay. have to do? Yeah, like um, for example, like stainless steel tiffins, which cost about $25, um, bamboo utensils, um, um, like hemp, um, uh, what's it called? 
um, shower curtains, which cost about $90, um, mason jars, um, uh, yeah, a variety of products like that. They're all extremely expensive. Oh, clean canteen water bottles. And not to say that they're not going to make from really great companies and we should support them, but like when we're making those the only faces of what the zero waste movement is about, then it's not allowing other people to, you know, think that like, oh, I could just, you know, use utensils from home and bring them with me. I have to buy in to this culture and I need to go buy bamboo utensils because that's what I'm seeing. Um, in addition to, I think, one um, – one uh, thing that the zero waste movement and I see a lot of environmental movements lacking is bringing um, awareness to the systemic oppression, um, specifically systemic racism um, that people of color are facing. So, for example, like when Charlottesville happened, like trying to get people within environmental communities to talk about that instead of ignoring um, the systemic oppression that people of color are facing. And so when you're not acknowledging that, like, people of color are, um, are being oppressed, whether it's mass incarceration, prison, uh, school-to-prison pipeline, uh, police brutality, environmental racism, the list goes on and on, um, then you're already making them feel like, oh, you're not recognizing my oppression. How could I ever feel like I belong within this movement? Um, also not highlighting um, people of color who are involved in sustainability work um, and by not giving them a platform, uh, you're participating um, with it, participating in the lack of representation of POCs within um, environmental communities. And this is as simple as like following people of color. Um, like when I first started Zero Waste, like a lot of the people I was following were not following any people of color which was bizarre to me because like, it wasn't that people of color aren't doing this stuff, um, but you're just not following them. Right. Um, and then, um, yeah, so. All right. Huh? All right. Um, so um, uh, this is um, a question that um, w we discussed um, during our um, test run, which was that, uh, you know, uh, Be Waste Wise uh, um, cares about representation and we've looked, uh, you know, every time we do look for, you know, diverse voices. And if you look at our um, history, you, you'll be able to see that um, female panelists um, have been like really close to 50%, you know, which is not boasting, which is not ideal, but then I think it's pretty um, high when compared to other platforms where, you know, people get a chance to speak. So uh, we do care about diversity, but um, it's also difficult um, to um, find people of color, you know, um, talking about these issues. I mean, we, we've discussed this during the test run. And um, so what kind of suggestions do you have, you know, for, for an organization like this? So I think we can get to that after Chanel responds to, uh, you know, um, what, uh, how she thinks um, the current zero waste movement and circular economy movement are superficial, elitist, or um, extreme. Can you, can you tell us what you think about that? Sure. Um, for, for the, so superficial elitist and extreme. Um, so with the superficiality that I'm referring to in that conversation is, is, um, what, what we see on Instagram, for example, is throwing, throwing the zero waste in front of anything else that you're doing. So zero waste dinner, zero waste shopping, zero waste clothes, zero waste beer, zero waste water. And so, um, which is good to generate support for the movement in general. But what I would love to see is us to talk about what does the term zero waste mean? Um, what does that mean for us as a people? What does that mean for people of color? What does that mean? You know, there's a deeper sort of motivation and intention that could be found and used as <coughs> like what Olivia is talking about in referencing um, current social times using this as a platform to do that and so um so the superficiality of it is sort of the trend that i'm seeing lately to to go zero waste but also to do it for appearances so that things look beautiful um which they do 
but but to see like what's underneath that like why am I actually participating in this because it takes a lot of energy and a lot of effort to participate in a trash light li- way of living in a linear economy where you're often met with resistance so you're already practicing that resistance so I think that it's it would be beautiful if we could expand that that resistance in order to um, dismantle oppressive systems and and um, including representation as part of that. So that's where I see the superficiality come from. And the elitist aspect, um, which we've referenced a couple of times, is I see class playing a huge role in this. And so if you're of an upper or upper middle class, it's really easy to see pictures on Instagram and like Olivia was saying, sort of, you know, purchase that zero waste starter kit and invest a lot of money up front to be able to, as sort of like a buy-in to be able to participate and be accepted into that community. And so um, seeing that, that if you're not able to do that, it's a hurdle, seeing that as a hurdle and acknowledging that class does play an issue in this movement right now. Right. Thanks. Um, um, Olivia, so could you talk about, you know, what um, organizations which care about your representation do, um, you know, so that they could increase the representation um, overall? What organizations who, um, I think um, making their, um, their resources accessible to people of color. So bringing, um, you know, zero, for example, within the zero waste community, bringing zero waste talks and workshops to communities of color, you know, not staying within your neighborhood, but like really expanding out, um, outside of your neighborhood. Um, in addition to, I think it's really important for environmental organizations to host racial justice um, workshops and trainings um, within both like that are um, available for the whole community community to attend, but also for the employees, um, for the people who are hiring administration, administ- administration staff, um, and making sure that the racial justice trainings are ongoing. Um, another thing is collaborating with Black Lives Matter and other racial justice um, organizations to see um, what they can do, um, how they can support one another, um, and um, and see if they have any resources they're willing to offer, slash if there's any resources that you can then offer. So like one resource that um, environmental organizations could offer to Black Lives Matter is um, teaching workshops um, for one of their events on zero waste or something like that. Um, and then another thing is making the information relevant. So like, um, uh, for example, like in the zero waste community, they'll talk about like hair care products for zero waste hair care products. Well, those hair uh, care products would never work for my hair. Um, but if you could offer some resources of like zero waste black hair products, that would be great. Um, in addition to a thing, following as many people of color on your um, social media platforms is really important. So, like, what I do is every, like, I'm, like, constantly looking for POCs um, on social media to follow. And just having them on my news feed gets me more familiar and comfortable with, you know, seeing, like, making that my norm, seeing people of color involved in sustainability. Um, and if you... Um, if you like my social media is filled with I'm following so many people of color so you can use me as a resource for that um and then also speaking um about um denouncing white supremacy and systemic racism um is so important to do it in a very explicit um in public way so that way people of color um can choose to see if you are a safe organization but not just say that but also show that um, I think it's really important um, uh, for not only people of color to see, but also for um, white people to see that you're an organization that denounces white supremacy and you're doing this um, X, Y, and Z. Right. And um, uh, this, uh, when it comes to representation, I mean, uh, this is something that we also see in a developed world and developing world kind of perspective, um, you know, where poverty, uh, people who are actually in poverty, do not get represented uh, much in you know talks about their future, um, and um, so um, I understand uh, you know where this is coming from. When when you know you're discussing someone's future, I think there should be uh, enough representation from their side 
uh, from the actual people who will be impacted by these, you know, climate change and um, other environmental uh, um, other environmental problems. So, um, Chanel, uh, do you have any um, suggestions on what an organization which cares about representation can do? Uh, real quick, we only have ten minutes, um, and and um, so yeah, please, please go ahead. Sure. Um, yeah, I think one important aspect is how we approach it. So. Um, thinking about the ideas of charity versus solidarity and understanding how how we begin to engage. And so thinking about solidarity in a way where it's it's aligned, it's supportive, it's there's a little bit of a risk there. Um, so you're willing to sort of take a step down from and decentralize from a place of privilege to in order to really be alongside um, the organization that is is working towards resisting these things and um, creating and supporting a zero waste movement. And so, and then seeing charity as something that's like, oh, okay, well I can like give some money, but I'm not going to actually be involved all the time or, or something like that, or, or coming to it from an attitude of like fixing something like I'm here to fix this for you. Um, and I think that in solidarity, it's more supportive. You're at, you're listening and you're providing resources, shared resources, and you're alongside um, alongside the other organization. So I think that continuing along those lines of solidarity w amongst each other and um, really supporting communities of color that way is, is really important. Um, and then also from the aspect of representation, um, decentralizing I think is really important as well. So hosting workshops, but also sharing that information so that way the organization can also lead their own workshops and finding a way that maybe um, you find something that's already happening in your city and you can volunteer and support that effort and see what you can do to contribute to help them um, do what they're already doing. So those sorts of things I think are really important. Right. And um, one more question to um, the two of you before, you know, we um, end this session. And um, this is something that um, I've heard from uh, many people. Um, for example, when I'm working on environmental issues and then I talk to someone in a company um, who doesn't deal with environmental issues and then ask them to think about this, the general reaction that I get is, you know, we are so busy, you know, um, we're already doing so many things and we are also working towards certain causes and um, thinking about the environment is, um, you know, it doesn't always happen, you know, because we only have limited time and we have to um, choose what we do with that limited time. I mean, that, that's the kind of response that I generally get. And um, I see something similar um, could be happening. I mean, when I'm working on, on you know, B-Waste Wise or these issues, um, and when I hear about representation, that it might feel um, to me or, you know, other people that, you know, oh, you know, we're already doing this. You know, we don't have, we only have so much time to do all of this. So why should we worry about, um, you know, another problem um, that maybe others are already taking care of? So, uh, I, I mean, it's just choosing between identities, I guess, you know, which one you want to uh, focus more on and which one you want to, you know, build a career on or build a, uh, you know, your, your life on. So, um, I mean, uh, for someone who's who's um, in, in such a position, um, uh, what's your message? How, how can they um, think about this? And uh, so, yeah, please go ahead. Um, Chanel, do you want to go first? Sure. Um, yes, I think that's hard because this is that's the question that we're asking is is where what is your intention and what are you willing to do to support it? So if your intention, um, you know, on paper is to support diversity and to, you know, to to do these things, then then taking action towards those things is really, really important. Um, I think that we're at a time where just saying it just isn't enough and taking those steps and maybe it feels a little bit risky, but that's that's part of solidarity to me. I think that that, I think that is exactly it. And those are opportunities to really choose, choose what to do and how we're going to do it all together. Olivia? Um, I get, yeah, I get the, that response often, um, just trying to collaborate with local environmental organizations. And I typically respond by asking like, who are you saving the environment for then? Like, why are you saving it? Like, who is it for? Because if it's for people, uh, if it's for people, then, like, you need to support them, too. It doesn't have to be either or. And you could see things like white supremacy as being a backdrop to climate change. So just changing your perspective, being more intentional on, like, 
who and and asking yourself who am I saving the environment for? Um, yeah. All right, and um, so do you have any um, final um, concluding remarks? You know, we have just five minutes, so. Do you have anything to say to everyone who's watching? You know, what should they remember? What what they can do, and you know, how they could follow you. You know, I know um, you guys are only on Instagram and not on Twitter, and that's something uh, Olivia and Carter told me that Instagram is now you know really going big. So I'm going to talk to them about that. But you know, just just tell, tell us uh, where they can follow you and uh, what they should remember. You know, um, t uh, thinking about this subject. Chanel or Olivia, either one of you can go first. Um, I guess my biggest thing that I want people to take away is how important it is for everyone to denounce white supremacy and take action to support communities of color, marginalized communities. It, in almost every large issue, marginalized communities are disproportionately affected. And I think it's so important for white people to educate themselves on their oppression, denounce their oppression, um, and also um, provide that education to other white people. Um, and my Instagram is zero waste have a shot. H A B E S H A. All right. Thanks, Olivia. Chanel. Yes. Um, so my my last thoughts would be to to continue. What the common response I get is that they people just don't know where to start or don't know how to engage. So I think keep asking questions keep exploring, keep it being engaged. So if you don't know something, ask, reach out. Um, I know that I am happy to facilitate, point you in the right direction. Um, my Instagram is at think, feel, be. So think, feel, be all together. That's on Instagram. And um, follow Olivia's Representation Matters series. Share, repost. Um, it's all good. <laughs> I think um, sharing is uh, one of the first steps towards, um, you know, change. So um, we should all, if we like something or uh, if we're learning something from, you know, what you're watching or what we come across, I think we should all share. Um, um, so, yeah, if you if you are learning anything from this um, video stream, from the session, um, please do that, too. And um, just to, you know, um, uh, just to... Um, give support to what uh, Olivia said, I think we would uh, denounce white supremacy. And I think uh, when all of us w are working towards uh, improved life on this planet, I think um, uh, dealing with injustice is the first thing that we can do. And uh, white supremacy uh, based on their notions, I think is a big injustice to um, uh, all people of color. Uh, and uh, not just um, white supremacy, but maybe even brown supremacy. Uh, I, in India, I see a lot of brown supremacy. I mean, uh, they, uh, they think they're you know the oldest civilization. Therefore, you know everything will will do, or you know they have their own um, um, backward notions. So uh, I would denounce any kind of uh, single community supremacy. Um, so um, let's let's um, maybe end this uh, session there, and then next we have uh, Olivia and Carter Rice joining us. Thank you, Chanel, and thank you, Olivia. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome to the 2017 Global Dialogue on Waste. Um, the, the the first time I came across um, your uh, organization, I was really impressed. You know what you're doing, um, and um, let's just um, get it out. Um, you know, get the age thing out. You know, um, it's really impressive that at this age you're able to do all of this. But then I don't think that really means um, anything else other than that, other than the point that you, you started so early in your life doing something like this. So um, congratulations on that. And uh, so um, can you um, tell us a little bit more about what you're doing, how you started and when you started um, and why you felt like you had to do this? Yeah, so we started One More Generation about um, almost eight years ago. And our goal was to save endangered species at the time. Uh, we had been adopting cheetahs, our aunt had been, um, and we kind of just felt that if we wanted our children to be able to see these same species and these same animals and the environment that we're living in today, we had to do something. We had to change the way we were, you know, buying things or, um, you know, supporting different organizations. And we felt that that was a huge need in society today because we're seeing, like, a decrease in like empathy for like animals and the environment and it's kind of sad but 
we felt that if we could teach people and teach, you know, students how to care for things that they don't know about, then we could like change the world. Like, you know, even if it's small parts at a time, um, it'd make a huge lasting effect. So that was the main reason we started uh, One More Generation, and we started mainly just because of endangered species. Right. And um, why did you uh, think you had to teach people? I mean, um, what was it going to achieve for you? Um, the reason why we wanted to <clears throat> teach um, people was because if we don't start changing um, our environment and the way we live now, it's just going to go downhill from here. Right, right. Uh, that's a very quick, um, succinct answer. Um, so um, th this is one of the questions that I have. So in the 1990s, when um, you know world leaders came together for you know the uh, um, UN summit in Rio to talk about climate change and the future generations and sustainable development, you know they were talking about um, doing all of this for our future generations in the 90s, and um, I think um, they were you know actually talking about you guys. You know you, you're the future generation and you're already here and now you know you're um, old enough to have your own opinions and you know be able to um, you know talk about what's going on and you know ha have your own views on it so um, I wanted to um, find out from you you know what do you think of the current progress that that has happened when it comes to the environment or um, or to waste management or you know to the plastics problems that you work with you know what do you think about the progress you know what kind of viewpoint do you have can can both of you talk about it for a while? Yeah. Um, so I think that the the progress is, um, I don't know how to exactly describe it. I think it's like a little bit uh, slow. It could be going a little bit, you know, faster. But I think that um, when we go to schools and stuff and we try to teach about, you know, plastic pollution or like animals and stuff, we think that a lot of people don't know about it. A lot of people don't know about these problems that, we are seeing and it's proven that you don't care about what you don't know about so that's the whole point of what we're trying to do is if we teach people about like you know these specific issues then they can have more care for it. they can look at their life differently and see how they can make a change and how they can maybe speed up the process of getting these like organizations to you know be better stewards of the planet. Right, and um, Olivia? Um, I agree with that. If we don't educate the youth, um, like I said earlier, it's going to go downhill and um, because of the environment today and um, different government issues, it's just, it's kind of not the, how do I explain it? Um, kind of not the way that we should be living. Right, right, so it could be much faster um, and uh, more people could do more about you know what's going on, right? And um, Olivia, so what do you think um, could be the reasons why you know this is so slow? Um, one reason is maybe people aren't. Well, of course, there are tons of people who don't know about this, but um, I think that if people don't know about it, the adults should start to learn and then go ahead and teach their kids, or the other way around. What we encourage is that kids teach and then they go and teach their parents and teach their friends and stuff like that. But um, one reason is that um, maybe some schools don't um, involve a certain environmental teaching program or something teaching about what you can and cannot recycle, even if it's just like an hour lesson. Um, another reason is, um, of course, like I said a minute ago, the government, um, the new government, um, they despised of Obama's um, peace treaty um, or the environment treaty that he made in Paris and um, so um, that was that was um, leading to helping the environment as well but they got rid of it so um, that's one of the reasons why it's kind of slowing down right right um, makes sense so um, all right and um so uh, talking about Instagram, uh, I mean Olivia and uh, um, Chanel. None of them are on Instagram, uh, are on Twitter or anything else. They're only on Instagram. So, and you were telling me that you know that's that's big. So, um, should um, tell us a little bit about you know that 
and also tell us uh, a little bit about other tools, not just social media, but also storytelling or other kinds of tools that you use to engage people? Like, how do you talk to them? You know, what kind of methods or what kind of tools do you use to, you know, communicate your message? So uh, we like, I, okay. Okay. Um, we like um, to do social media a lot, of course. We use Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Um, I'm not sure if we use any others. I, I don't think so. But those are our main big three, and we're able to spread the message quite fast, you know, because of the Internet. Um, but we also feel it's very effective when we go and teach people. Um, like actually in person when we can go and have like a little stand or something and just you know give the message out we think it's a lot more powerful for someone to hear from like youth voices to other youth that they can make a difference and that this is not only our world but it's their world and it's going to be their future like generation like their kids their grandkids it's going to be all their planet too um, we feel like art is also definitely a huge thing that we do. Uh, we have a pangolin awareness campaign and we have this giant um, 12 by 8 art sculpture, um, sorry, mural, and we get people to put on like scales of this pangolin animal. And um, so it's just showing that there's so many different ways you can talk to people. You don't have to talk, you don't have to send a message. It can be through art as well and just a visual. A visual can make all the difference as well. Um. Also, to add on to kind of what Carter's trying to say is that um, because of the kids nowadays, they grow up with all the technology, all resources that they need right on their phones, cell phones, tablets, TVs. And um, so we use um, um, Instagram and Twitter and mostly Instagram because um, younger kids nowadays um, more have the, that platform. Um, to teach and raise awareness about different issues that are going on with hashtags, um, different um, accounts, and things like that, along with our art campaign. So our pangolin campaign has that hashtag of um, every five minutes because a pangolin is being hurt every five minutes um, or is being killed every five minutes. So using hashtags can get people more interested in different um, projects that we're doing and maybe that um, they can, and also a great thing about Instagram is that you can actually text or basically it's kind of like a small email platform where you can um, tell people about um, or ask us questions about how they can get involved and different things like that. Um, so um, can you, um, uh, well, uh, so can you talk a little bit about um, your experiences? Um, you know, talking to different people. Um, I know you've um, stopped uh, usage of straws and uh, plastic lids in um, a, a big facility. Um, so can you talk about those experiences? You know, what kind of change you brought um, by now and uh, what kind of experiences you have talking to people? So um, right now we're working on the One Less Straw Pledge campaign where we're asking people to sign a pledge saying that they won't use a plastic straw for 30 days but instead they can use paper straws, glass straws, or any kind of re renewable source. The reason it, uh, for this is because in America alone we use over 500 million plastic straws every day, and none of them ever get recycled. We're trying to create awareness about that with um, different, we're partnered up with Delta um, airlines and we're trying to get them to reduce the amount of plastic they use on their airlines as well as plastic straws that they hand out. Um, so we uh, met with them a couple excuse me, a couple weeks ago to um, meet up with them to discuss um, different uses for straws, um, stirring sticks, salt shaker and pepper shakers, different things like that, packaging and um, the reason uh, for that is that um, because these are only single-use items, and they get usually thrown away, and none of them are really recycled or can be able or able to be recycled. So um, that's just the one less drop pledge that we're working on. And we usually get strong feedback. We um, get a lot of people accepting like what we're trying to teach, and when that happens, it's so much easier, you know, to teach the people because they're open-minded. Um, sometimes we get people who aren't especially open-minded, but we can usually convince them when we give them all the statistics and all the facts and, you know, a lot of people do care for animals, so when we bring that into the picture, 
it also shows them that this is not only affecting the environment, but also affecting you, animals, pets, I mean, basically everything. Right, right. And um, so um, can, can you tell uh, people who are watching, uh, let me just um, remind them that, uh, you know, uh, we're watching the um, we're watching Olivia and Carter Rice um, for uh, the twenty in the twenty seventeen global dialogue on this, and they're talking about their uh, nonprofit One More Generation and uh, about their activities um, through that nonprofit. So, uh, if you have any questions um, or comments, you can put uh, use the Q and A box below the screen, and you can um, submit them um, to be answered. So. Um, so back to you again. So can can you tell people who are watching how they can take the um, one less plastic, um, one less uh, straw campaign? Uh, how, how can they how they can take the challenge? And in addition to that, if not that, how else can they get um, involved in uh, you know environmental activism? So well, we what have they a, do? Oh, sorry, um, we have a one less straw a pledge campaign uh, or like website. So it's onelessstraw.org. And if you go on there, you'll see three different sections. One will be individual pledge, then the school pledge, and then business pledge. Uh, the individual, you can sign up. Um, that just basically says that you are going straw-free for 30 days. Well, plastic straw-free. You can use, like, glass straws or metal straws or bamboo. There's so many different resources that you can use. Um, the school is where you get students to go to school, get your school signed up. And during a week, you get people to, you get the faculty and staff to give all the students a signature, an individual signature, and they can sign that. But then the, the students are tasked to go home and get their parents to sign it as well. This creates like a ripple effect, and it'll spread the message more and more. And then the business pledge is for any business, really. Um, we get restaurants as well to... Uh, sign on saying that they will only serve straws upon request. So they won't just blindly hand out the straw so that they're not using an excessive amount and they're saving money by not using straws that people don't use. Uh, we have also have a website, onemoregeneration.org, and you can find all our animal campaigns. You can find a link towards onelessstraw.org, and you can find out different ways that you can get involved with the environment and animal conservation. Um, Olivia, did you have something to say? Oh, no, he basically covered it all. Okay, okay. And, um, all right. And um, also, uh, talk a little bit about um, your generation. I mean, um, you know, uh, people who are not in your generation, like all the older people. You know, we have um, a lot of, uh, I guess, misconceptions about it. So, tell us a little bit about, uh, you know, how, how your generation is responding to, you know, the planetary scale challenges that we have. You know, how, how you talk to each other about this. And can you talk about that a little bit? Um, so basically, um, we're, what we need to do, what people need to work harder on different schools is educating the youth because the youth is the key to um, solving most of our problems. And um, so the reason why is because um, then they'll go home and they'll become the teachers in the family and they'll teach, like I said earlier, their parents, their friends, and stuff like that. And it just spreads. It's kind of like a ripple effect. Um, of teaching in a fun way, but um, we also need the um, older ed um, older generation to <clears throat> to educate themselves about the issue. Like Carter said, you don't care about what you don't know about, and um, the reason um, why for that is because the older generation won't care about what the newer newer generation um, is talking about because they are the ones who made the problem. We do feel that the younger generation usually does, you know, um, respond pretty well because when you've got other peers talking and showing that they can make a difference, it really is kind of empowering to the students. I remember when um, I used to have lectures at my school and, you know, grown-ups would come up and talk and if it was a subject I was really interested in, yeah, I, like, I always wanted to listen to people talk, but you could see that other kids were, you know, like bored and they were like like slower at catching things um but if you can make it like a presentation a little shorter and give them all the information they need they usually can grasp it 
Uh, so I think that they're taking it really well. The older generation is taking it pretty well as well. At the beginning, they weren't because you know we were really young kids, and they said, "What do you know about stuff that I don't already know about?" Um, but now that we've gotten a little older and we're more influential than um, than we used to be, they start to listen to us a little bit better. Right, and um, um, so from um, from from your hindsight, from your experience doing this for a while now, um, what are your suggestions for someone who would like to start, uh, you know, something like what you're doing, like a nonprofit or do something on their own? Like, where do they start, and what should they do? Do not do. Like, what does your hindsight say? If, if someone comes to you for advice, you know, what would you tell them? I think. Um, yeah, either one of you can start, and I want both of you to talk about this. They should definitely um, be passionate. Of course, if they're very passionate about it, they should go out. Of course, tell other people about it. Tell their parents until, because I remember coming home telling my dad, "Oh, I'm so excited about this," and he would just go over his head, because, uh, um, and I just kept telling him and telling him. One day, um, it kind of finally stuck with him, and he's like, "Oh, I see how passionate you guys are. Let me help you out with that." And um, definitely try to get the message out there. If you're passionate about something, follow your heart. Um, and just try to help other people or get pe other people to help you. Um, I also want to say that whatever you're passionate about, it doesn't have to be environment. It doesn't have to be animals. It could be youth empowerment. It could be anything. Just, you know, go through with it. If you're really passionate about it and you know this is something that you want to do, don't stop at just telling yourself that. You really have to go through, like Olivia said, and tell everyone you know. Because that's what we had to do. We had to tell our teachers, we had to tell our parents, we had family members, you know, and finally it happened. So, I mean, that could happen to anybody. All right, great, thank you. Um, um, Olivia and Carter, um, I, I, I feel like I, I um, woke um, Olivia very early in the morning, so sorry. sorry about that. I've been yawning the entire time. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that's cool. So, yeah, uh, sorry about that, but thank you very much for your time. I mean, greatly appreciate what you guys are doing and uh, what you had to say. I think that was um, really insightful. Um, so, um, let's um, then move on to the next session with uh, Madison. She's already here. And um, thank you very much for your time and all the best with your um, campaigns. And one last time, could you tell us uh, where everyone could go? Um, you can go to our website at onemoregeneration.org or the onelessstraw.org page and sign the pledge. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, um, both of you. H have a good day. Thank you. You too. Have a good day. Madison, thanks for joining us, uh, and uh, thanks for all the good work that you're doing. So, um, can you tell us a little, bit, a little bit about, um, you know, um, what you're doing, about what Global Green's doing, and the program that you're coordinating? Sure. So, Global Green is a national environmental nonprofit. Um, we have offices in uh, New York, DC, um, LA, and New Orleans, and we basically um, run a multifaceted range of programs around the country underneath the umbrellas of green urbanism and resource recovery. And as a part of uh, one of the bigger projects we've been working on under resource recovery over the past couple of years is working to help expand the implementation of food scrap collection programs in multifamily buildings. Um, so like compost collection in, in apartment complexes. And one program that came out of the model that we're putting forth is um, our program. So an eco-ambassador, um, is uh, basically someone in a, an apartment complex that wants to take a little bit more ownership over the waste diversion program in their building and uh, can serve as an on-site resource for their neighbors. Um, so one of the main challenges that we face in multifamily um, recycling programs is high turnover rates. So theoretically, that eco-ambassador would be be um, someone who plans to stay in the building for a long period of time. And so as uh, tenants move out of the building and new neighbors move into the building, that eco ambassador can take it upon themselves to go and introduce themselves to their new neighbor and um, explain the waste diversion program in that building and let them know where they can get any resources such as a kitchen food scrap pail to keep in their kitchen or um, different educational materials like food waste prevention strategies, different things like that. Um, so we've been working throughout California to expand that program and we're also trying to work with um, uh, other cities around the country in order to help them implement a, an eco-ambassador program. 
Great. And um, uh, I know you're also conducting a survey of other eco ambassador programs. So can you talk to us a little bit about, you know, what kind of results you have and uh, um, and um, maybe compare the different eco ambassador programs just so that we understand, you know, um, what parts of what program work best um, according to your situation? Sure. So I have, I have some notes here. Um, basically, uh, our program is still really new. We've had about um, four training workshops. So what that means is uh, in the beginning of the year, we, we had several recruitment events to try and gauge uh, public interest on if, if the communities that we're working in want these Eagle Ambassador programs. And uh, we had a lot of um, public support in that, so that was encouraging. Um, and then over this summer, we've hosted a few training workshops, which is um, like a two hour workshop where we basically make the tenants um, uh, experts, um, well, waste experts for the city that they live in, um, and then teach them how to talk with their landlord, how to talk with their um, with their neighbors, um, uh, how to teach teach their neighbors about waste, um, and uh, basically when they come out of this two-hour workshop, they should be fully confident on how to be an eco ambassador in their community. Um, to date, we've had a pretty good turnout in our training workshops of like ten to fifteen um, ambassadors coming out of there uh, for each workshop, um, and we we only hope that that number will increase. Um, as for results of of the ambassadors, we don't have that data yet just because our program is really new, but that is something that sets our program apart from others in that um, we've talked to other cities uh, with eco-ambassador uh, eco style programs um, and they don't really keep in touch with ambassadors after the training workshop. You know, they, they keep the metrics of how many people came to the workshop, but they don't necessarily reach out to the ambassadors after the fact to see if they actually perform the outreach to see um, how the program is going. Um, so that's something that we're trying to implement, something that we're trying to solve. Um, and, you know, next week we're sending out our first round of post surveys to the ambassadors that came to our first workshops um, to see just how successful they were with the tools that we gave them. Um, whereas in, in the city of Seattle, um, their Friends of Recycling and Composting program, they've, uh, they've served over, uh, or they have over 5,000 multifamily buildings and since 2010 they've trained over 750 ambassadors, so that's a pretty robust program. Um, similar to the City of Toronto and Ontario, Canada, they, um, their trainings are three, three hour trainings, um, and plus they require 10 hours per month extra um, time of their ambassadors, and they've trained uh, 370 ambassadors to date. Um, and so these ambassador style programs are, are found all over the place, at least as far as North America that we're aware of. Um, but they all um, they all kind of collect different metrics, and they all kind of um, teach their ambassadors different things. For example, in uh, Washington D.C., they have more of an overall holistic sustainability volunteer program rather than just um, uh, waste ambassadors. Um, so it's. I, I don't know, it, it seems to us that it seems to be a, a, a pretty successful way of, of reaching out to the community and of educating people. Right, I, I, I mean, uh, the, the way we could understand the ambassador programs is um, if you're in a city uh, which wants to uh, make change and then, you know, which, which wants to progress um, with their uh, waste management system, and if there are also citizens uh, which, which want to do something similar, then the ambassador program could connect both of them. I mean, it could provide support to the city from the citizens and then for the citizens from the city. Um, so is that one way to understand, you know, um, this this uh, ambassador program? Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the reasons why we're, why we're trying to expand this uh, ambassador style approach is because um, we found that uh, when rolling out these recycling and organics collection programs, face-to-face um, -face outreach with residents is key. Um, in order to increase or in order to boost participation, um, and so that's really resource and that's really resource intensive. Um, sending a paid staff person, whether it be from a city or a third party, to go out and perform this outreach should take several hours and several tries at each building to try and reach as many people as possible. Um, and so, by using ambassadors, um, they're this is a voluntary position for them, and they're most likely a self motivated person. They they care about whatever it is that they're that they're talking to their neighbors about. Um, and also by having someone in that building be the one performing that outreach, um, 
oftentimes the community or they, they represent the needs of their community and so they can kind of get over any any language barriers that might be present or um, they might be able to to translate materials in, in, in whatever languages need to be translated to or even we found that you know, in some buildings, people are more likely to open the door to a neighbor than they are to some random stranger on their doorstep. And so it's just, it's an easy, well, it's a, it's a more resource efficient way um, for city agencies uh, to, to perform this outreach, whatever the outreach might be about. Right. And um, what kind of cities um, does a program like this work? Uh, I mean, we, we discussed this during the test run. Um, so, um, does this work um, only in progressive cities, which have already done, you know, quite a bit with their systems, with their waste management systems, or um, is there also potential for ambassador programs to work in other cities? Um, what are your thoughts? What have you seen? Um, I think there's potential for ambassador programs um, in in wherever the city might be on the progressive spectrum. Um, I mean, we're Global Green is headquartered in, in the city of Santa Monica that has a pretty progressive plan for sustainability. So we found a lot of public support very easily here for this program and they're trying to roll out their organics collection programs on top of their already robust recycling program. But um, for example, we're also working uh, more of a consultant to the city of Atlanta um, and they, they're just trying to um, better roll out their just recycling program. Um, and then you know, they'll, they'll have the Eco Ambassador program to help boost recycling and then, um, you know, whenever they're ready to roll out organics collection, then they can just add that on to the, the ambassador curriculum for their training workshop. Um, as far as any, as far as waste goes, I think the ambassador program can help cities at whatever stage they're in to just increase education and to increase awareness and participation. Right. And um, so as, as someone who's been implementing a program like this, um, uh, so what are the challenges that you face, um, you know, when you're doing this? You know, what's the biggest challenge that you face and uh, how, how do you deal with that? Sure. So um, we haven't uh, encountered any challenges with, with recruitment of ambassadors yet. So that's a positive. Um, uh, I mean, we're assuming maybe data collection will be a challenge. We don't know since we haven't sent out that um, that post survey yet. But um, we found since other cities haven't collected that data, maybe that would be a challenge. I mean, it's it's challenging to to reach people when you're not face to face with them in the first place. You know, not everyone um, checks their email all the time. Not everyone um, will return phone calls. So um, you know, we're hoping the data collection won't be too much of a challenge, but. Um, I wouldn't rule it out. Um, we're, let's see, um, we're also asking ambassadors to perform lid flip waste audits. Um, so that means that you open, um, you open a waste bin and just from what you see on the contents of, of the top, um, how much contamination is in the bin um, and how, how full it is. And, you know, I've, I spent most of this spring in a dumpster and I'm perfectly happy that way, but I can assume that like a lot of citizens wouldn't necessarily want to, you know, touch the lid or even look inside, have to deal with the smell. So we're assuming that that point of data will also be a challenge to collect. But since our program is so early, um, we haven't exactly encountered that many challenges yet, but I'm sure they'll come up along the way. <laughs> Right, uh, th that's actually good. Um, but um, do you also have uh, um, any um, experience learning? Um, I mean, surveying other campaigns, um, what kind of challenges they might be facing, and you know what they're doing about it. Sure. So I think um, one, uh, one challenge is, uh, or rather. <laughs> One challenge that other cities might have in implementing these programs what could be recruitment and how to reach people, how to get the word out about this program. Um, so, I mean, my suggestions for that would be uh, to give it an online um, presence, especially through social media. I feel like that's um, a large part of why we have been able to reach, reach such, a, such a wide audience it's because Global Green has a Facebook presence. We have an Instagram and a, a, a Twitter um, presence um, and so we can really just boost out our flyers of come to this eco ambassador event come to this training workshop or we also um, work with city networks to um, put out uh, advertisements and flyers through their 
uh, newsletters through their online newsletters um, and other programs have had success in creating an online portal um, platform for their ambassadors to be able to communicate with each other and in, in, in order to to put to disseminate inf information so I guess that would be my suggestion to to avoiding that challenge of you know not being able to reach very many people is just um, really, really boost the online presence in order to maximize the amount of people that you can reach. Right. So um, uh, you're saying that Global Green, um, ha having a good online presence to start with um, and having good personal and professional um, networks kind of helped um, Global Green, you know, um, address this challenge. And then uh, you would suggest that uh, these organizations um, also um, collaborate with other uh, bigger organizations which have such online presence or which can help Absolutely. them. Yeah, maximize any, any networks you have. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, all right, so, um, and um, what are some uh, frequently asked questions when you're, you know, doing this uh, workshops? Uh, what do people, uh, how do people respond to them? You know, uh, what kind of mindset do they come into these programs and, you know, what do you talk to them about? Well, one really great thing um, that we found in our workshops is that those that are coming are really interested about waste or about at least what they can recycle. So there's always um, a big conversation about when we, so we put on this graphic of the different things that can go into the blue recycling bin and people are just, um, they, you know, they're happy to have the information, but there's always lots of questions about the different types of plastics that can be recycled, um, as well as uh, what to do with household hazardous waste, like batteries and electronics. Um, and we even take them through an exercise that just is a series of 25 images of different, uh, different items um, <clears throat> and ask them, okay, which, which bin would this go into? And um, so we found that that residents are really in, are really interested and engaged in the different things that they can put into into waste bins. So that's encouraging. Um, as for other questions, um, you know, it's always a, a big a bigger conversation of how to talk to your neighbors about this program because we ask them to first before they even talk to their landlord um, to ask a few of their neighbors, if not all of them, depending on how big the building is, um, would they even be interested in having this organics collection program? Um, because that way, when you go to your landlord, you can say, you know, um, most, most people in this building want this program. So, um, so, uh, that's a, that's a good reason to, <laughs> uh, to have us implement this program. Um, and so I guess one bigger question or rather, just one point where I feel that the ambassadors are really engaged is, is in learning how to talk about waste and in learning how to talk with their landlord, talk with their neighbors about waste and, and how to educate their peers on, um, on proper waste diversion. Right, and um, um, generally um, recycling um, in apartments is a big problem in cities like New York, um, you know, where uh, most of the uh, population lives in apartments. Um, so, um, and I know uh, there is a Manhattan Solid Waste Authority um, board swab, you know, which is uh, trying different ways in which they could engage more um, people in the apartments, uh, you know, in the recycling programs. So um, do you have any suggestions for, you know, uh, cities like New York or other cities who are starting out, you know, um, and uh, where, do, where does the driving, uh, the drive to change come from? Does it generally, um, in these programs that you see, does it generally come from a nonprofit organization or does it come from a, the city itself or, you know, where does it come from? And depending upon where it comes from, you know, how, how should each one of them think about, you know, making the program work or making the program bigger? Sure. So what we've seen so far is that for the most part, these programs are, are put on by cities um, or are, are run by cities uh, or sometimes it'll be run by the city. But um, but the actual program or rather the program will be put forth by the city, but the city will will um, hire a third party to to run the program. Um, and so I guess suggestions for for how other cities can um, can facilitate these programs uh, or rather um, to really start them um, and to gauge public interest is to start with the community start with 
um, start small and, and work your way up, not just cast a wide net. And um, I guess that this would be more so for the case for New York, but I'm guessing for, for other cities, for other bigger cities as well, this would, this would be the case. Because every community is going to have different needs. Every community is going to need um, the education to, to be focused in a certain way. And so you can't just cast a wide net assuming that that's, that, that whatever value proposition you're putting forth is going to apply to everyone. So you really need to, to work with the smaller scale communities and then work your way up to a bigger program in order to, um, you know, make sure that the, that the program is valuable to everyone that it reaches. Right. And, um, one final question. So uh, we have uh, another nine minutes, and uh, let me just remind our viewers that uh, you're watching Madison Gitlin from Global Green. She's talking about um, apartment. Um, she's talking about engaging uh, um, apartment buildings and recycling, and how ambassador programs could help um, help cities or nonprofits do this better. Uh, nonprofit change agents do this better. And um, if you have any questions for her or any comments, use the Q and A box below. Um, to submit them, and uh, we'll try to get them answered. And uh, Madison, so could you also tell us a little bit about um, how how Global Green got involved in doing an ambassador program? You know, what what was the uh, motivation, or what was the where the push came from? And also, uh, uh, can you tell us, you know, what are the future plans for for your program? Do you plan to expand to other cities, or do you plan to expand more in this city and then you know move on to other cities? What's your timeline and plan like? Sure. So we started uh, in the beginning of 2016 um, with a uh, larger funded project to work in both the San Francisco Bay Area as well as LA County in implementing um, uh, organic collection programs in 30 multifamily buildings um, throughout those two areas. And um, our, our program approach um, is testing the um, the effectiveness of enhanced resident engagement strategies. So what that means is that we are testing the effectiveness of, of us going door to door or hosting some type of event in each building where we handed out kitchen food scrap pails and different um, educational materials uh, in order to teach those residents how to, um, how to divert their organic waste properly and also how to recycle properly if, if the building wanted us to talk about recycling as well. Um, and so in forming this model, because um, we want to make it as replicable and scalable as possible for other city agencies to be able to adopt in their, in their rollout of organics collection or of even recycling, um, I, we, we were doing some research initially and found the ambassador style program in the city of Seattle and in the city of Toronto um, that really, you know, made it seem as if their program um, had a large effect in, in, in not only identifying buildings to, um, to roll out these organics collection programs, but also to boost participation in those buildings, because you can, you can put a green cart at a building and, you know, it could be that no one knows that it's there or how to use it. So by having, uh, or by performing this outreach or by having an ambassador at that, at that building, um, you know, you can better educate the, the residents on how to properly use that bin so it's not just sitting there. Um, and so uh, we just we decided to start an eco ambassador or to try and recruit some eco ambassadors in some of those 30 buildings that we were initially working with. And the program just really jumped um, in that we, we received a lot of public support for it. So we figured why not try and, and boost this program to, to be all that it can be and see what kind of effect we can have in, in the communities that we're working with, with this Eagle Ambassador program. So um, it's really just snowballed since about January of this year. Um, and we now have a base of, I think, over about 70 people that have shown interest, mm -hmm. um, around 10 to 15 people that are coming to those, to those workshops. Um, and then, you know, where we see this program going, um, we'll be hosting workshops, I guess, probably throughout like early fall and we'll be, um, you know, retrieving those metrics that we spoke of earlier. Um, and so I guess our role fall through winter and where we see this program going in the future is working with other communities that we haven't even worked with yet and working in other cities or with other agencies. 
um, to help them start their own eco ambassador programs. Right. Um, we have um, two questions um, um, for you. One of them is uh, from uh, Vivek Patil. Um, he's asking some citizens expect the benefits to appear quickly. So, um, you know, what? what can be the short-term incentives for citizens to recycle? And the second question is from Charlotte, and she's asking, uh, what feedback are you getting from the eco ambassadors themselves? You know, um, so these are the questions you could answer them in any uh, sequence. Sure, so um, as for, so incentives to the resident um, for these eco ambassador programs, um, I mean, it's it's a it's a challenge in multifamily buildings to really show what incentive um, these recycling and organic selection programs have to the resident at least immediately um, because they aren't the ones necessarily paying the trash bill their property management is so if they're able to increase their diversion uh, which would most likely decrease the the landfill trash bill um, because oftentimes in cities that are trying to put forth city uh, recycling and organics collection. Um, the collection of the recycling and organics is offered at a lower cost than landfill. So if you're diverting more of your material out of the landfill bin and into your recycling bins, then that could result in a decreased um, frequency of collection or maybe you get a smaller bin for your landfill trash. So um, there are a number of factors that could result in decreasing your, your trash bill, but that, that decrease isn't necessarily seen by, by residents. Um, I guess one benefit to residents of these ambassador programs would be creating more of a community feel in their building. Um, I mean, ambassadors can do whatever they want with the program. They can either just do the door to door and then call it a day, or they can even you know host events in their building that bring the community together and talk about their food waste. Um, we've seen programs that where a community comes together to create a zero waste like meal potluck. Um, so it can really, depending on how the, how involved the ambassador is, it can really create more of a community feel in a building or within a community itself. Um, uh, just by, by having these programs and by, by giving ambassadors the agency to you know, to, to work with the community in a way that maybe they didn't see possible before. before. So, um, um, yeah. Go ahead, Madison. Oh, I was just going to move on to the next question. <laughs> uh, yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. Okay, so as for uh, feedback from ambassadors, um, again, this is something that is coming with our uh, post survey that we're sending out next week. But overall, you know, when, when we finish the training workshops, um, people in these in these workshops come up to us and and just you know thank us for for giving them the, for giving them these tools and this information um, on how to start these programs in their buildings because we've met a bunch of people that are like you know I've really wanted this service in my building for so long but I had no idea how to do it and I had no idea that that I could just reach out to the city and start the program you know um, so um, we've overall just you know received the feedback of Thanks for these tools, and thank you for teaching us how to how to bring the programs to our buildings and, and how to you know talk to our landlord about it because it's 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 a useful skill. <laughs> Great, and uh, one final question before um, you know we move on to the next session: um, Are you just dealing with um, the recyclable waste, or is this something also also that deals with organic waste composting? So our program so far has been. Um, focused on, on organic waste. Um, but, you know, other programs have, have only focused on recycling or have focused on recycling first and then will bring in organics when that city agency um, or, or service area is ready to bring on organics. Um, but for the purposes of our program, at least in California, we're working with organics collection because that's where, um, that's kind of the new frontier of recycling in the state of California. We're pretty online with with normal, uh, you know, like plastic and metal recycling and paper, um, but organics is really the next the next mountain to climb. And so, um, uh, yeah, we, since this program came out of our our project that started last year, in order to implement organics collection in multifamily buildings, we've mostly been working with organics collection. 
Um, sorry, I was saying, great, wonderful. Uh, thanks, Madison. Uh, thank you very much for your time. I uh, greatly appreciate all the work that you're doing, and um, I wish all the best to your uh, program. And um, so, uh, so I, I'm going to. Um, so, uh, is there a well? F finally, before we leave, uh, can you tell us about uh, where people can learn more about your program? Where where they can go online to learn more? Sure. So they can go to globalgreen.org and um, look through our projects or through our blogs, and they'll be able to find more information there. Um, yeah, that would that would probably be the best place to find information on it. <laughs> okay. All right. Wonderful. Thank you so much, um, Madison. Great. Thank you for having me. Yeah, friends, we have um, Chris Kane from the Post. Landfill Action Network, and uh, the uh, the abbreviation is PLAN, which is uh, which is really impressive. Uh, that's something that I was found impressive. So um, well done with the naming, and uh, and um, so uh, Chris, can you tell us a little bit about uh, what you're doing? You know what PLAN does, and uh, what kind of traction you're getting, and also about you know what you're going to do today. Yeah. Of course, yeah. Um, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Great. So, um, as Ranjit said, my name is Chris Kane, and I'm the uh, Director of Research and Resource Development with the Post Landfill Action Network. Um, what we are is a national nonprofit that works with students and staff members at campuses, uh, particularly colleges and university campuses all over the country, to um, help them start and sustain waste reduction projects uh, with the ultimate goal to get those campuses to be zero waste. And along with teaching those um, kind of specific projects and how to implement those on their campuses and within their communities, uh, which some of those projects I'll talk about today, we also teach students on kind of like general skills building for planning any project, whether they are in the field of sustainability or other fields, um, volunteer management, marketing of different ideas, um, leadership skills and leadership turnover. Um, and fundraising. So a little bit of both in that uh, we do a lot of organizing skills as well as uh, specific zero waste program advising. And we currently work with 80 campuses across the country, uh, helping them to move towards zero waste. Right. And um, uh, so I think this is something that, uh, that's that been really impressive about, uh, about you, which is not just focusing on the technical knowledge, but also you've been you know, trying to um, uh, provide Access to communication skills, uh, access to learn communication skills, and organizing skills, which I believe are extremely important uh, to be able to, you know, handle any new change or any new movement to create change. So that's amazing, and um, I I'd like to thank Diana Cohen from Plastic Pollution Coalition for, you know, directing me towards you and, you know, getting me in touch with you. So um, thanks for that, Diana, if you're watching, um, and um, so. Uh, Chris, um, are you ready to um, begin your um, uh, presentation about the plastic-free campuses? Huh? Yeah, I'm ready to dive in. And shall I just um, kind of give you a note when it's time to go to the next slide? Um, sure. Yeah, yeah. Just just do that, and I'll be able to um, change to the next slide. But uh, let me just add uh, one more comment before we start. So, um, friends, so um, uh, the the challenges that we face, like climate change or plastic pollution, are really planetary. And the scale is really large, but the solutions are all local. Um, most solutions are local. So um, for us to be able to address uh, issues like this, uh, it's not enough if one person or one organization does something about it, but it's all of us you know, taking uh, whatever, doing whatever we can do in whatever situation we are. Um, and uh, like I mentioned earlier, um, leadership doesn't mean uh, you have to have a leadership position but you can be anyone anywhere in the world belonging to any community and you can still take um, you know, a step ahead and then uh, bring about change. So which is why we, are, uh, we thought it was really important to um, go through this manual which talks about how different many campuses, many university campuses can go plastic free as a first step towards you know, environmental, um, environmental sustainability. So um, with that, um, I'd, um, you know, I welcome Chris to you know, talk about the presentation. Excellent. Thanks, Ranjit. And I think that's a really powerful point um, before I dive into my presentation is the reason that we do work with campuses as we see them as sort of microcosms of society that can really mimic change in society at a larger scale. And so when you take a program that is maybe establishing reusable items in cafes 
or banning single-use plastic bottles, bags, microbeads, which I'll talk about today, um, on a campus, and you can kind of observe in a semi-controlled environment how that exists and what the challenges are, what the successes are, what the education outreach needs are, and what the logistics are, you can um, replicate that on a larger level with, with society. So um, it's a really powerful point that uh, smaller solutions, uh, whether you are a student leader or whether you are kind of more of a quote unquote follower, but you are you know, a very committed volunteer, you can just pop in to a project every now and then, every sort of effort is needed. And so that's what we really focus on in, in our advising. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about that today as well. But the main content that I want to dive into is how to establish a plastic-free campus. Um, so you can go ahead to the next slide. So what does plastic-free mean? Um, sometimes that might be a term that's kind of thrown around in a greenwashed way, but how we define plastic-free is reducing or eliminating the use of single-use disposable plastics. So Plastic is a very valuable material in our society and it's done a lot of good, especially in the medical field and um, in areas where maybe uh, drinkable water is not as easily accessible or with natural disasters, such as we've seen recently with the um, hurricanes and um, Hurricane Harvey and recently at Hurricane Irma. Um, but the daily use of single-use disposable plastics isn't really necessary and it's an item that takes a while to break down, um, if it will break down at all. Uh, it Once it does break down, it will uh, become particulates and to waterways, um, can feed into ocean marine life and ultimately feed up the food chain, causing um, hormonal imbalances and other health effects of ecosystems and people. So when we say plastic-free, single-use disposable plastics, we mean things like straws, water bottles, um, cutlery that you get for your to-go food, a uh, to-go container, and kind of the dreaded plastic bags. Go ahead to the next slide. So um, there's a huge movement around eliminating and reducing some of plastics. One from uh, one of Diana Cohen, who Ranjit mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, is from the Plastic Pollution Coalition. They are one of many organizations throughout the world who are working to fight um, pollution of plastic in oceans as well as in our more terrestrial environments. Um, both from the end of the line of, you know, how do you clean up oceans that are filled with microplastics to the beginning of the line of uh, how do you um, kind of resist the wrapping up of plastic production on uh, a more consumer level? Um, how do you take away the power of large plastic industry to be able to continually produce and profit off of um, a material that is extremely toxic. And so a couple of ways that you can kind of track the movement are um, through the Surfrider Foundation, Plastic Pollution Coalition, the Five Gyres Institute, um, PlasticBagBanReport.com goes into a lot of areas throughout the country where single-use plastics are banned in municipalities. And then I kind of listed some hashtags here that you can look up as well. You can go to the next slide. So when you're working towards reducing or eliminating single-use plastics, where do you start? Um, usually we like to start with assessing what exists on campus. So I'll go a little bit first into a plastic audit and how to conduct that and what that entails. And then I'll also be going into various kinds of solutions from the individual level uh, to things like you know bringing your own bag or um, up to the systemic level of changing infrastructure of somewhere like a college campus to no longer offer single-use disposable plastics. Good, thank you. And so first we're just gonna dive into the first steps. Next slide. So uh, plastic audits can be conducted in multiple ways. Um, one is conducting a visual assessment, which is purely just kind of observing the population of a campus or um, goers to a cafe or eatery establishment and noticing the plastics that they are using, whether those be you know, single-use forks, knives and sporks, um, water bottles, solo cups, coffee cups, things like that. You can also take a procurement inventory, um, and that involves kind of going to cafes and eateries and talking with uh, 
dining heads and um, managers or procurement offices on a campus, which is usually the office that is in charge of all purchasing for the campus, to discuss what types of single-use plastics they are ordering. So what number and how often do they order um, coffee cup lids and things like that. Um, and then there are different ways to track this, which we'll kind of go into those systems next. You can go to the next slide. So when you are conducting your plastic audit, you really want to keep these questions in mind because they will inform um, what alter alternatives will be best to replace the items that you're trying to reduce or eliminate from campus. And that is what plastics are being used on campus and where do they come from? Which of these items are most frequently used? Where are single-use plastics disposed of? So it's not only tackling the beginning of the line of when they're consumed, but when they're disposed of, how can you make sure they're disposed of properly? And who is the single-use disposable plastics on campus being used by? Next slide. And so this is an example of um, a visual assessment of a plastic audit. Um, you see we've got our various lists of plastics um, listed on the left-hand side there. And usually this can be um, maybe taking like an hour or two in a coffee shop sporadically throughout the week to get um, a representative and random sample to see what kind of items are people using. Um, where do you think they are sourced from on campus? Like for example, if there is, um, let's say a Panda Express or a Chick-fil-A or Starbucks on the campus, you'll be easily recognize the, the item from the, that logo and be able to record that. Um, or if there are items being brought out from from off of campus, um, how can you tackle those items? Here's the next slide. And uh, this is a procurement inventory. Um, so this is usually talking to a dining manager, the manager of a cafe, or someone within the purchasing office at your campus. And this is to figure out what types of material they are purchasing purchasing, the number that is um, and volume that is purchased each year, and the cost of those items per order. This is really important because if you were to suggest an alternative like a compostable to-go container or reusable to-go containers or um, offering a discount on people bringing their own mug, then it will be very important to be able to speak to the cost differences. Um, that's going to be one of the main, one of the main um, concerns of a dining manager procurement officer. Next slide, please. Great. And so just to go into a little bit more into procurement inventory, um, it's really important to establish a relationship with dining staff. Uh, usually they are very strapped for time. So if any of your students, uh, it's really good to kind of like establish rapport uh, with these individuals on campus and really kind of like listen to their concerns, be willing to negotiate on the project that you want to propose, whether that be phasing out you know, to go plastic boxes on the campus or facing like straws and really kind of understand where their, where their um, concerns are at. Um, it's also important to know if you have a purchasing office on campus, whether or not you should be talking to them or the dining services. And it really just kind of takes starting that conversation um, to find out which would be best. Another important thing to take into account is does your campus buy from directly from a company that produces things like um, coffee mugs or uh, disposable cutlery, or do they buy from a distributor? Uh, with campuses and also large business businesses, they will usually purchase um, supplies from a large distributor that uh, the distributor themselves is sort of like the, the middle person uh, that procures from the companies and is able to sell uh, products from various companies at a discount and bulk to their buyers. And then again, as I mentioned earlier, knowing the cost comparison for cost savings or potential um, potential higher costs. Next slide. So I want to go into a few examples that touch on both individual action and uh, systemic change. And so the first one is uh, a school at, at uh, University of Hawaii, Manoa. And they worked a couple of years ago to ban styrofoam containers. Um, a very passionate student who has worked with us for several years now uh, was kind of spearheading this effort and um, she eventually was able to pass a petition along with sort of a sustainability task group on campus to phase out and um, collectively ban uh, styrofoam containers from being used in dining areas on campus um, as well as any cafes that were contracting with the campus. Um, some of the major roadblocks that they came into 
were um, the cost of compostable items versus styrofoam items. So the hope was to replace these styrofoam to-go containers with um, compostable bioware type containers that were made of like plant material because the university did have the capacity to compost those items. And that's a really important thing to take into consideration is if you are looking for an alternative to single use plastics on your campus, you need to make sure that the alternative is like a compostable bioware to go container is um, disposed of correctly and the, the systems that your campus has for managing waste. So if there's compost available and that compost stream can handle um, uh, biowares that are produced from, from plant materials, then that's really important to take into consideration. Another major roadblock was figuring out what the transition period would be for campuses who, or excuse me, uh, dining areas on campus that had maybe had a lot of styrofoam containers in stock. And obviously they don't want to just throw those away. They'd like to have them used because they've been purchased um, and how to kind of figure out how to use that stock and transition into the alternative, which for you, Hawaii Manoa, was um, compostable to go containers. Some solutions that they came up to those were um, they were really fortunate to have a representative from the Bioware company, World Centric, uh, who was, uh, uh, I believe, a staff member on the campus and was able to sit in on the sustainability task force. So that individual was able to speak of all of the cost savings and cost benefits of the campus purchasing compostable to-go containers in bulk, as opposed to styrofoam to-go containers. Um, to give a little insight, World Centric is um, a for-profit company that produces different biowares, compostable cups, um, uh, cutlery, chopsticks, um, to-go containers, things like that, that are made from the um, the byproduct of wheatgrass, so they are producing the materials from something that would otherwise be wasted and uh, using that waste to, to create a new product. They used to be a, a nonprofit group and uh, switched to for profit so that they could continue uh, to allocate funds so that they can uh, channel those funds into composting systems and businesses and at universities. So the group was very fortunate to have a representative to speak to those cost benefits. And then as far as transitioning the campus out of uh, the existing styrofoam containers, they allowed a grace period for uh, cafes who maybe had a large stock and needed to get rid of those items. And um, really what it came down to was any new contract coming on campus had to, um, within their contract, ensure that they would not be using styrofoam containers. Uh, next slide, please. I just wanted to put this up because this is some language specifically from the proposal that they submitted to the campus to ban containers. And so um, something that's really notable in here is that uh, this applies to new or renewed food service contracts. So any new food services coming on campus or um, any food services that are currently existing once their contract is renewed, which is three to five years usually for like a cafe vendor on campus, then they would have to face a styrofoam. And then you can see here also that um, vendors operating under these contracts uh, were um, advised to kind of like um, the grace period of using up the items that they have before switching over to compostables. Next slide, please. So potential partnerships for if um, like your campus um, or you are interested in doing this in your business place, something like that, are um, on the right there. That is an example of a world-centric compostable to-go container. And um, often you can, if you're looking to kind of establish this large scale, you can negotiate um, a discount with World Centric on that. Um, and then on the left there, those are Preserve product containers. Preserve is um, a US-based company who um, has all US-based products that are made from recyclable materials and they themselves are uh, number five plastics and so can be recycled at the end of their life. So that's another example of um, a reusable to-go container that um, can be reused time and time again. Next slide, please. So uh, next example uh, that we're gonna speak to about roadblocks, solutions, and potential partnerships are uh, banning single-use water bottles on campus. This was done by the University of Vermont back in 2013. Uh, while it, was, it came from an effort four years in the making from students trying to petition to ban water bottles on campus, um, what as it was banned, uh, students initially thought this would be a huge success, but actually find that once water bottles were banned on campus, students uh, decided to be procuring 
sugary drinks more. And so it wasn't that any less single use um, plastic bottled beverages were being uh, purchased by students. It was just that the items that were being purchased uh, tended to have a more negative health effect on the student population. Um, so some of the solutions that uh, came with this, and this, this is a really important uh, case study because it's often assumed that, well, if we ban plastic water bottles, then we will ban the, the issue of, of plastic bottles on campus. But there needs to be um, alternatives in place so that students can uh, get their drinks from um, other sources. And so some of the solutions that University of Vermont um, employed were filling stations on campus. So that involved kind of retrofitting existing water fountains on campus with uh, long neck type spouts or kind of um, some of you all may have seen like a water bottle filling sensor um, so that reusable water bottles could be filled up on campus easily. Um, also, they wrote into their contracts for bottle beverage purchasing that half of bottled drinks on campus had to have certain health standards. Um, so they reduced the amount of sugary drinks on campus. Campus also did not offer sodas or bottled beverages that could be found in like um, a soda fountain type of format. Um, and then also they launched a drink local water campaign. So really focusing on tap water and the value of that. Uh, next slide, please. And so some potential, um, oh, it looks like the picture on the right there got a little fuzzy, but uh, some potential partnerships for if your campus would like to do this is really uh, working to see if there are companies that you can procure reusable water bottles for to provide students with, whether that be an orientation or um, something that they can purchase at the bookstore, something like that. And on the left here, you've got Liberty Bottles, which is again, a US-based company. And then on the right, um, it's supposed to be a picture of a clean canteen bottle that is co-branded. So this is a really good opportunity for uh, student groups on campus that if your campus is switching to reusable bottles, then um, student groups, whether that be like an environmental club or um, uh, an athletics team on campus can co-brand and have their logo on those items um, to kind of support the, the image of the school. Um, another important partnership in these types of projects are uh, community partnerships. And so um, there are some campuses that locally uh, within the municipality, things like bags or bottles have been banned. And so to kind of piggyback on that effort can be uh, sort of a catalyst to banning those items on campus and make it more accessible and, and less confusing so that when a, a student goes from their campus environment to the local community environment, uh, it's consistent as far as the types of materials that are used and how waste is disposed of. Next slide, please. So my final example is uh, reusable to-go containers on campus. And so this is the system that is really in place for when something like styrofoam containers are banned from a campus. And maybe your campus doesn't compost, and so you don't have the capacity to have compostable to-go containers on campus. It's also a great opportunity because it's always within um, the perception of the uh, waste reduction hierarchy. It's always best to reuse before recycling and composting. And so reusable to-go containers and reusable anything is really the best option. Um, a reusable to-go container program is essentially um, within a system, uh, within a campus or a business or municipality, uh, cafes and eating areas will have uh, look at plastic containers, sort of like the green one that I showed on the screen earlier. And uh, these are kind of uh, circulated through a system in that when a student goes to pick up their meal at a cafe, they can have the meal served in this uh, reusable to-go container. Um, and then once they are done with that container, they can drop it off at a drop-off location on campus or can bring it back to the next cafe that they go to and have it washed and cleaned behind the counter. Uh, usually students are opting into this as maybe like a small fee that is a part of their tuition that they're automatically opted into, or um, they can choose to opt into this. So they might pay $15 for the container for the entire year and then use that throughout the year. And then um, once they return uh, their container at the end of the year, they can get that as a refund. So um, it's a really interesting model that um, if folks want to get my contact info and learn more about it, after the presentation, I'd be happy to share. Uh, so some roadblocks to this, um, 
you can go back to the previous slide. Some robots to this include um, just upfront costs of buying reusable containers and not for each student on campus and for them to be in circulation for when there are some that are dirty, you want to have enough that are clean. Um, also, containers can sometimes get lost, stolen from students, or even broken. Um, and then what do you do when you have a visitor to campus who isn't necessarily opted into this program, um, but you want to be eliminating single-use containers from campus? Uh, some of those solutions were, as I mentioned earlier, to have an automatic charge on student accounts so that when someone becomes a student of a campus, they are automatically opted into this program that um, on their student ID, you know, they swipe when they go into the cafe and uh, they are automatically able to receive a reusable to-go container and that they can get refunded for that at the end of the year once they return the container. Um, Charging for lost containers is a great way to for the program to just kind of sustain itself financially. Um, and then eliminating the disposable counterparts. So uh, in order for the reusable to go container program to be a success, there really has to be um, there has to be an incentive or maybe a little wiggle room to not use that program. And so some campuses have been able to phase out um, the majority of their disposable containers so that uh, using a disposable container when you go to eat out or a drink somewhere is a last resort. And then um, uh, another solution to having like visitors on campus is for um, those visitors to maybe put uh, down like a $15 refundable charge to use a, a reusable to-go container in their time at the campus and then they have a 48-hour uh, period to return that at a drop-off location or at a participating dining location and uh, then they will receive the deposit back on their on their account. Can go to the next slide. And so some really important potential partnerships for this are, um, as I mentioned earlier, the Preserve product containers. They um, produce a lot of containers that are really useful for this system. Uh, some campuses use a manual take back system in which when a student is done with their container or it's dirty and they need to get a wash, they'll give it to a dining staff member at the front who like lets them in. Um, or you can have these uh, sort of like passive return stations to our campus on the right here. Uh, OZ is one company that um, creates these passive stations and it's essentially, you know, the container is inserted back into the, into the collection system um, and these stations can be serviced by staff members. So that's, that's a little bit more convenient because maybe you've got a student who's studying for finals and it's 2 a.m. and then you drop off their container, they can do this rather than waiting till the dining area opens. Uh, next slide, please. And so with all these solutions, uh, before we go into some time for Q&A, um, I really want to touch on a couple main points and that uh, partnerships are really important for any sort of successful program, whether it be um, banning single-use plastics or reducing them, and that's important because you want to have alternatives to those disposable plastics, and it can also be really useful to align the values of the campus or the goals of the campus with the surrounding community that the campus is set in. And so maybe if you have, um, if your campus has particular ties with the local government or um, city government in which your campus lives, then to be able to discuss, like, hey, is there an opportunity for a program like this to exist outside the campus as well? Um, positive and negative reinforcement um, is really important uh, to uh, negotiate the difference between the two. So uh, a lot of times, uh, programs like bring your own reusable mug or bring your own reusable container, things like that, will um, provide a discount on drinks for that item. Uh, and a lot of our research, we've actually found that to be less effective than if you actually have a negative reinforcement in place. So that being that um, reusable is the only option, and if you have to use a disposable, then you are charged extra. So it's just a really interesting finding that we find. Um, and then with any of these programs, it's always constant communication, education, outreach. You can have the best signage through campus, you can have the best communication as far as social media about these programs that exist. Um, but there's always going to be someone who overlooks that, and so it's constant communication and not giving up on that. Um, next slide, please. Um, so I apologize for the busyness of this slide. It was supposed to have some animations, but um, basically this was to um, emulate the resources that we have as a network, whether you are a student or a staff member on campus and are looking to reduce waste on your campus. We advise on not just plastic-free initiatives, but also um, establishing reuse spaces like 
uh, campus uh, thrift stores or free stores, um, starting expanded recycling projects for things like hard to recycle items like styrofoam or electronics, um, conducting waste audits to assess like what is the situation on your campus and then what materials need to be targeted that could be reduced, um, to go container programs and um, also food recovery, gleaning food, and composting on, on campus. And so um, I would love to get in touch. Um, I don't have my contact info on here, but it is chris, C-H-R-I-S, at postlandfill, P-O-S-T-L-A-N-D-F-I-L-L, dot org. Um, and Ranjith, I'm sure that that, uh, that information will be, will be available as well after this presentation. Um, and then you can go to the next slide as well. Um, but uh, kind of shameless plug is that we are having a conference in November in Philadelphia at Temple University where for the entire weekend we'll be talking all about these kinds of initiatives as well as how the zero waste movement um, intersects with the social justice movement and climate change. And so if you're interested in that, we would love to have you. We usually partner about 500 students and staff each year and representatives from other nonprofits. So um, definitely reach out. We'd love to have you register. Thanks a lot for that. Um, a few thoughts. Um, a few thoughts. Uh, let me just mute you for a minute. Yeah. So um, a, a, a few thoughts are um, so uh, in the conference. So I really um, recommend if anyone's watching who's interested to um, go to the conference. I've heard uh, really good things about the conference from Diana. Um, and um, also, um, when I was looking at the conference um, a little earlier, maybe last month, I saw that Kate Bailey was going to speak there. Um, I thought she was um, really awesome. I've read some of our articles, and um, I think, um, yeah, it, it, it's really awesome to have you know good speakers. There. So I think it'll be really useful for everyone to be there. And um, another uh, point that I want to mention to Chris is, um, so we just had a, um, a call in the morning with uh, Olivia Lapierre and um, Chanel Crosby from B0. Uh, they're working on representation of uh, people of color in the environmental movements. Um, so you know, if you could uh, um, increase representation of um, such communities in, in the conference, you know, that'd be amazing. Uh, or you know, you could get in touch with them. Uh, I can provide you the details. And um, once once uh, this conference, uh, once the session is over, we'll also of course provide Chris details on, on our uh, website, maybe um, after uh, next week. Um, and uh, we'll also put um, the details on uh, social media uh, if required, you know, to, so for, for anyone who would like to get in touch with them. Um, so um, just a few questions from based on the, um, based on the presentation. Uh, one is, um, so how many campuses uh, do you have involved in plan right now? I mean, how many people from, uh, how many campuses are working with you or engaging with you? And um, second, um, how many are implementing this model? How many are, you know, are trying to implement this model? You can unmute yourself, Chris. Great, that's a great question. Um, we work with uh, about 80 campuses currently. Um, we probably within the next month or two, we will ramp up to about 100 campuses nationwide with a few in Canada. And um, those are all over the country. Uh, we originally started on the East Coast, but have since expanded and have a lot of campuses throughout the West Coast and in, in the Midwest. And um, I would say that uh, the majority of campuses that we are working with um, are kind of like all over the board. So there are some campuses that are, you know, they've got an entire department committed to zero waste. Um, and they've kind of like really figured out how to how to communicate how things like waste and climate change intersects with environmental justice. And they're, they're doing like a really rigorous work around that. Um, whereas there's some campuses who have yet to get recycling on their campus. And so we're working with a wide variety of kinds of like people are at and, and dealing with waste management and how it intersects with other issues. Um, and so to, to answer your second question, I would say um, maybe about half of our campuses are implementing some sort of plastic reduction campaign, whether that be uh, providing kind of like a positive reinforcement for, hey, bring your own mug to the cafe and we'll give you a 50 cents discount or something like that, um, all the way to a more rigorous system like a reusable to-go container program 
Um, we've actually been able to create an entire guide on the to-go container program based off of some interviews with some of our member campuses who have successfully implemented this. Um, and that's a resource that's also, that's also free, um, as well as the Plastic Free Manual in which this presentation was based. And so folks do not have to be part of a member campus to access those resources. And again, I'd be happy to provide those um, after the presentation for folks. Okay, all right, great, wonderful. Okay, all right. And, um, and, uh, uh, let me mute you again. All right. So, um, uh, all right. So, um, wh when it comes to um, creating change, you know, you you always um, come across opposition. So, um, you know, in in while while trying to uh, make campuses plastic free, what kind of opposition or where do you get it from mostly? Um, is it just inertia to change, you know, or is it more than that? Is is it uh, outright opposition to you know what you're doing? And um, if you do get such kind of opposition, how, how do you deal with it? You know, what kind of experiences do you have and what, what examples do you have? Unmute yourself. So um, there is kind of all ranges of opposition, some being as small as well. It's not as, um, it's not as sanitary to use reusable plastics. And my answer to that is, well, we've been using reusable forks and knives for for ages, and that seems to be serving us fine. Um, but I think that's that's part of that is um, part of a smaller discussion, which is an inertia to change overall. Um, one of those inertia to change factors, I think, can be a fear that uh, reusables are going to cost more um, because plastic is a really affordable, cheap product to to be able to use. There's a reason why we use it at such a large scale. But um, there have been a lot of studies, and um, also within the manual that I mentioned, there are some resources as far as calculations on how to um, analyze kind of cost-benefit analysis of switching from um, disposables to compostables or reusables and the cost savings associated with that over time. It might not be an upfront cost savings, but over time, it usually is. Um, and they're also kind of like the secondary costs that are saving as far as uh, the impact on people and the environment. Um, and then I would say kind of the overall inertia to change um, would be that there are some, in some instances, there are just kind of like no, um, there are no infrastructure for the ability to like ban an item. So for example, in the state of Arizona, there is legislation that essentially bans bans. And so at the uh, Arizona State University, uh, they were able to kind of like get very sneaky with the language that they used to discourage single use uh, disposable plastics. So rather than banning them, they um, were saying things like, well, you know, if there is uh, um, food coming into our athletic venues, uh, none of those can be in single packaging, like single chip bags, like it must be provided in bulk and that we will serve those chips in sort of a compostable boat style. Um, container. And so there is ways and means to get around that. And so that really comes down to kind of knowing your local legislation um, as well as the sort of like policy of your campus and uh, working with folks, whether that be a champion on campus that's like a professor that you have very good rapport with um, or even folks in the community um, to be able to work with you to kind of figure out the, the loopholes that there are to, to jump through to, to pass that. Great, wonderful. Um, and uh, one more question. Uh, we actually have a question for you um, online. Um, it's from Vivek Patel. He's a student at Auburn University. Um, and um, he says he's really impressed by the work of PLAN. And uh, what kind of support will PLAN provide if I start doing it on my campus? Does it need to be done through another campus or student organization or plan can have its student representative on campus? Yeah, so um, plan ourselves, we, none of us are students. Uh, we are all full-time staff members graduated. So um, we advise from afar and it is usually like a student like this student individual um, who expressed the question, who is particularly passionate on the campus and wants to start a program that will reach out to us. Um, and if they can get sort of like some support from their peers or kind of like a champion staff member, uh, we can get them signed up with a membership to access the resources so that any students on campus can access 
our online trainings, monthly calls with us for advising. So that essentially they are the representative for plan on the campus doing doing the work and implementing the change. We kind of advise, advise from afar and provide the best practice work. So I would encourage, I didn't catch the name, but uh, for this individual to, to reach out and I'd be happy to discuss more with them, kind of like how, like what they're interested in starting and how we will support them more tangibly. Great, wonderful. Um, and uh, one final question. Um, we have only um, four minutes, so um, if you could respond to that and also, um, you know, give any concluding remarks, that would be great. And um, let me just um, remind everyone that um, uh, this is the uh, collective action theme on um, uh, on the 2017 Global Dialogue on Waste, and you were listening to um, Chris Kane from PLAN. And um, friends, again, uh, the, scale, uh, the scale of the challenges that we face are planetary, and all of us have to take a step forward and do whatever we can on based on what uh, irrespective of our situation in uh, personal professional lives or where we live or what we do. So um, uh, that's the only way in which we could um, uh, solve planetary challenges like this. And um, since 2013, BWASWAS has been um, uh, disseminating knowledge on, on waste management. And if not for us, most of this uh, knowledge would have been uh, immobilized in lengthy PDFs or would have been uh, limited only to um, really expensive international conferences. So we are extremely happy about what we're doing here. And um, so the final question to um, Chris. Um, I think what you said earlier kind of rest, um, answers this question which uh, um, that I have, which is, you know, if you're a student, you know, in which year do you start? Um, and how do you transition once you have to graduate? How do you transition the leadership from one to the other? But then I think what you said earlier probably answers that answers that question? I'm not sure. So do you want to respond to this or and also conclude? Yeah, um, so it's really, we work with students to kind of start at any time, whether they are first in their first year of college and really excited, or they are in their last year and have a project that they really want to have implemented before they leave um, in their time there on their campus. But um, obviously we work with them to kind of say, okay, that's awesome. Let's leave your mark and, and create a positive change before you leave. But we need to make sure that there's someone to kind of look at off and, and take over this project after you leave. And so working alongside like a lower class, uh, like a, someone in um, like a freshman, sophomore uh, type of uh, year um, and, and ensuring that leadership turnover takes place really smoothly, um, compiling sort of documents of all the project notes, all your contacts and being able to pass that items over. Um, and so we can talk a little bit more about that like on our uh, online trainings that we run each month. But um, yes, I would say that really all it takes is kind of alluding back to what you said at the beginning, Ranjit, is that um, it really kind of takes an individual passion and seeking out um, a little bit of support on campus, whether that be a staff member who maybe is already stretched thin, but they've got enough time to say like, you know what, yes, I will work with you periodically to look over your you know, business plan for this project on campus. And if you can find other students to be involved, if you can seek funding and seek support from groups like PLAN, then I will back that and kind of like be your champion on campus. Um, sometimes there isn't that staff member um, support that exists just because of bandwidth. And so there's a lot of power within students and what they can do on their campus um, and kind of making their time on their campus worth it while they're only there for maybe four or five short years. Um, and so that, that this is just a kind of long way of saying that really anyone can start at any time. And I think also something I want to close with too, and keeping in mind of uh, representation in this movement, um, is that I encourage that uh, for folks who see, you know, being zero waste or the idea of zero waste inaccessible, there are many ways to do it and there are many steps to doing it. And I think there's a lot that we can learn uh, from existing practices of um, you know, many people throughout the world and what their concept is of reducing waste and what their concept is of thriftiness or um, using materials to the most of their needs. And so I would encourage that to be a kind of a continual part of the conversation um, and, and also encourage that, you know, any, any knowledge is, is power in that um, to contribute to the, to the um, innovative solutions to materials that are kind of, you know, less advantageous and, and don't make sense to the economy that we're in that. And so, um, yeah, I would just kind of, as in closing, encourage you all to, if you're interested in doing something like this on your campus, to reach out. 
Um, we'd love to see you at the conference. And um, I think this is really brilliant. Renji, thank you um, for inviting us to, to present on the materials um, and be a part of this. This is awesome. How are you? I'm, I'm good. I'm good. It's late here in Bali, Indonesia. But to head to the right. airport. We had a wonderful, a wonderful summit, the East Asian Summit on Marine Debris Solutions, and it was just phenomenal. Right. Um, um, I heard quite a bit about the summit. So, okay, can you tell us, um, you know, what's been going on, and you know, what were they talking about, and what, what did you think? I know you've been really excited about the summit. So, can you tell us what is it that that inspires you so much about the summit, and then while you're doing that. I'll set up the video and the uh, the timeline for, for your book. Sure. So the, the summit, it's the East Asia Summit um, Conference on Marine Debris Solutions. And it's back to back with APEC. These are two very big conferences. Uh, that's some background. Sorry, I'm in a, a restaurant here. <laughs> about to head to the airport. But the, the conference just ended, and we had delegates from all of Southeast Asia, from Vietnam, from Thailand, Cambodia, from Laos. Uh, here in Indonesia, and, and the summit really, it's a response to, you, you may have seen a research paper by Jenna Jambeck in 2015, where she was the first time looking at a global estimate of which countries were the biggest polluters. And what we found was that, well, what she found, of the top 20 countries, China was first, the United States was last, uh, Indonesia was second, but 11 of those countries, the top 20, were from Southeast Asia. So that got this entire region kind of in an uproar, you know, wanting to understand, okay, this is really bad. You know, it's bad for the image of, of the region. Indonesia recognized they're a second to China, so they, they hosted East Asian Summit. So for the last, the last two days, it's been conversations and conversations about what do we do to stop the flow of plastic waste from all the Southeast Asian countries to the ocean. We've heard from scientists, from policymakers, from, uh, from the plastics industry, from NGO leaders, like the Mother Earth Foundation, uh, uh, Froilan uh, Grabte had a chance to come visit and talk with some people about some of the initiatives on decentralizing MRFs. You had uh, uh, other countries making their own commitments to improving their, their waste management. And then you had some really interesting debates about whether you know, waste management should go in the direction of energy recovery or much better composting and sorting for recycling. And now I'm in the camp where if you get really good at composting and recycling, then you got these residuals to deal with, and then you can figure out, okay, do we ban these, these hard to recycle products? Do we redesign them? Industry is favoring waste energy for a bunch of reasons, and, that, and there was a lot of debates around that. But I found, you know, what, I, what I took away from this is that there, there are strong commitments being made, that the attention is here to, to stop the flow of trash from land to sea, from a part of the world that has very little waste management and a lot of introduction or, or importation of, of plastic packaging and single-use materials and a loss of that to their, to their watersheds and wash them on beaches out to sea. So now I walk away really optimistic seeing a lot of effort being put to this issue in this part of the world. Um, right, Marcus, um, uh, I think um, that's really amazing. And um, I've been part of the um, Ocean Conservancy um, uh, work that was also done on Indonesia, Philippines, and Vietnam. And, you know, I was part of the report which did, um, I, I mean, provided many solutions and waste energy was part of it. So, um, you know, um, so I'm like, if you would say then I would be on the other side of the debate, uh, people could consider me on the other side of the debate, but I'm really happy. I mean, I've, I've always uh, loved talking to you and I've been really happy seeing what kind of uh, um, movement this has become um, about marine plastics. And um, I believe, uh, I think you uh, and uh, Five Jars Institute and um, uh, uh, Captain Charles Moore from Algalita, I think all of you had a really huge role to play in this movement becoming um, so big. So um, congratulations on that. And uh, um, it's really amazing to see all of this. So 
with that, I'll, I'll go to the video, and then you said you could lip sync it, so um, maybe if you could do that. Uh. Hang on a second. Let me get my glasses on. This should be amusing. I mean, if, <laughs> this video, I should give some context before you play it. All right. Explain what it is. So um, my wife, Anna Cummins, she and I began the Five Gyres Institute almost 10 years ago. And our first big project, working with, uh, with Algalita and Five Gyres together, uh, don't start the video yet. Hang on a second. Okay, so we built a raft out of 15,000 plastic bottles. We put them into old fishing nets, made long pontoons. And on top of that, we put a square deck made from about 25 sailboat masts that we found broken in junkyards. And on top of the whole raft, this recycled raft, we put an old airplane. We went to the, the craziest junkyard in the desert in California on the airplane, put it on top, called the whole thing, called it junk. And Captain Charles Moore dragged us about 60 miles off the coast of Los Angeles and let us go with no motor and no boat to follow us. And what we thought would be a, a four to six week trip turned out to be 13 weeks, very slowly drifting across the ocean, using those gyre currents to get to Hawaii over 2,600 miles. And in the middle of the ocean, we were running out of food. We were down to eating peanut butter and fish. I, I fished this fish out of the water. It's a fish that I saw being born in the beginning of my trip. And it, it was me and my co-navigator, Joel Pascal. He, he and I are the two sailors. And Anna stayed back at home on mission control. And she was saying, hope you guys catch fish. And we caught this fish. You'll see in this video. When I open the stomach, you'll see what poured out. All right, let me play that. Um, All right, let's try and lip sync this thing because I know you don't have sound from the video. Yeah, so let, let me play this. So I'm starting now. So I filleted this fish, thinking we're going to eat it, and here's what I found. It's full of plastic. This is the whole reason that we're out here to bring this to your attention. Your attention. The plastic the fish won't pass it. The fish plastic won't pass it. The plastic is full of organic, 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 organic things like TPDs, DDT, 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 Right, right. It, it, it made the point that, you know, in the middle of nowhere, and this is going back 10 years, in the middle of nowhere, we were down to you know, eating you know, a few fish we could catch and, and peanut butter and some granola, and here is this fish with these particles that pop out of its stomach. And the particles, as we know, and your audience knows, they absorb all kinds of persistent organic pollutants, uh, many pesticides, even oil drops from cars, any kind of hydrocarbon is going to stick to plastic. Middle of nowhere. And the point that I want to make is that since that point, since that, that fish discovery, we have gone from maybe a, a little more than 100 instances of or papers describing animals impacted by marine debris 10 years ago, now well over 1,200. The, the world is now, we're seeing is contaminated. Our entire biosphere on land and sea is impacted by, by plastic pollution but also the, the distribution of plastics. So what Five Gyres has done, we published a paper about two and a half years ago. It was the first estimate of all plastics, all sizes, and all oceans. And that was, uh, the big number was 269,000 metric tons from 5.25 trillion particles. So looking at these ecological impacts and the distribution, we can say it's all on global. The impact and the distribution of microplastics is everywhere worldwide. So I think we all, we all know that. Enough science has been done to act, and we're seeing actions happening. I, I love the, the, the last speaker uh, just now talking about um, the, the end of landfills, you know, trying to get away from the fact that we dump all, all this stuff. And then you and I could talk, I think, at length about, you know, what do you do with all the residuals then, the unrecyclables? Right, and I think, right. Like, Back up real quick, you know, to here in Southeast Asia, what we're seeing is 
this is like ground zero for the movement. The break free from plastics movement ha has spawned from industry's reaction to Southeast Asia wanting to deal with their waste. So when you get really good at recycling and really good at composting, and the Mother Earth Foundation in the Philippines has, has done this through, this, through, through the, the, the decentralization of MRFs. What that means is, instead of having all the trash have to be transported, all this mixed waste, mm. mixed organics and household waste, all sent in big trucks and a lot of expense and having to pay for trucks and fuel mm. and, and later move to a landfill and dump it. When you take the transportation out of the equation and you do all this locally and decentralize small MRFs and you employ the waste pickers to go door to door and teach people how to sort their, their materials, let waste pick pickers keep those recyclables they're collecting from door to door, bring the, all the, 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 the organic waste. What you get is a very efficient system of localized organic composting, localized recycling collection, and you get residuals. And what they estimate is about 30% of the waste stream is, are the residuals. They're getting 70% diversion by doing this. Then you have to ask, what do you do with those, those residuals? And that's where I think is the, the place where we have this great divide. And that's, that's in the book that I have that just came out, The Junk right. About the Draft. My second last chapter is called The Great Divide. Right. And, right. and the thesis in, in the book is why is energy, energy recovery such a big card that the industry is playing? As opposed to, let's just get really good at recycling and, and organic composting and the residuals, that's where we have to redesign things that don't fit in the recycle market. Right. My thesis is that industry, if they, if they allow recycling, recycling to get really good, imagine if, for example, the United States, we recycle only about 9.2% of our plastics. If they cut it over 50%, that means that this year's plastic, we, we then use it next year. That makes the need for virgin plastics drop tremendously. Industry over the last 50 years has enjoyed this 4% growth curve uh, of increasing demand for virgin pellets. If recycling mm -hmm. gets good, there's, there's no need for, or not much of a need for virgin plastics anymore. So I think to right. maintain demand, it's the essence of planned obsolescence. Get rid of last year's plastic through energy recovery and incineration. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right, great. So um, let's uh, let's then uh, move to the uh, so uh, that's the second uh, penultimate chapter in the book. So let's actually go through the entire book and your experience, um, you know, uh, which made you write the book. So um, I have the timeline here um, ready. So uh, when you say next slide, I'll move on to the next slide, and you can you know you can walk. walk through. Yeah, we just went through these photographs really quickly, and I'll, I'll tell you about them. So this is. Uh, you can see Anna Cummins and Holly Gray are volunteers uh, moving the bundles of plastics. This is uh, in probably March of 2008, where we're beginning to assemble this, uh, uh, these pontoons. Now, keep in mind, at this time, no one had been to the Western Pacific or the Eastern Atlantic in the North. No one had been to any of the, the, the subtropical gyres south of the equator. And we had some models that told us, you know, that trash might go to the five subtropical gyres. Charles Moore had been to the North Pacific extensively, so that was the setting. We knew very little about how much was actually out to sea. We knew very little about ecological impacts. So there was a lot of room for public awareness, and that's what spawned this, uh, this rafting voyage, why me, Anna Cummins, and Joel Pascal came together to build this raft. Okay, go to the next next photo there, and this is a uh, this next photo is launch day. So the photographs being taken from the dock where we had a couple hundred people up there and many more on the dock behind the raft, and you see all those little bottles lining the edge of the raft. That was our that was our water in stainless steel little canteens. You can see the airplane right there, clear as day. the The raft was heavier than I expected. We had a we had a whole bank of batteries. We were completely off the grid, a very resilient little raft. We had brand new solar panels, 
and a brand new wind generator. Other than that, it was junk, all recycled junk. And, and we launched. So next slide. So that is, and, you, and you'll read about this in the book, our, our first catastrophe was day three. Uh, I stepped out of the raft and into water. The raft was sinking. What I discovered was that the ocean was pulling the bottle caps off of the bottles. So within a few days, and we had a big storm that first night, about 50 mile per hour winds, we suddenly found ourselves in about almost more than one foot uh, sunk overnight. So I called Anna, and I said, Anna, we need some help. So she, she chartered a boat, and she, she found the middle of the ocean and, and handed us about 100 tubes of glue because we couldn't give up. And we, we spent one day together pulling bottles out of the raft, putting the caps back on, and putting the bottles back into the raft. And I did that every day for about two months to keep that raft afloat. So we kept going. Next slide. And we got down to the, the, the border of Mexico. The raft didn't go toward Hawaii in the beginning. We actually did 800 miles south and never crossed a line of longitude for three weeks. But we got to the border of Mexico and the US Coast Guard began circling around our raft. And the Coast Guard finally said, okay, who are you guys and what are you doing? They must have thought we were smuggling something you know, in these bottles Know, down the coast. And then once we explained who we are, what we were doing, um, I think that sort of legitimized our case and we kept going. The next slide. This next slide is, is a very joyful photograph. That What you see behind us is the last bit of land, Guadalupe Island. We, we discovered a mini gyre behind that island where uh, the wind, it was, it was all, it's actually called a wind shadow, where the wind would hit the island and then it there was no wind behind it. And when our raft got stuck there, we were stuck in this circular current of the waves and wind. And for, for almost three days, we stayed behind that island, making these giant loops until finally we were, we were kicked out, spit out, and kept going south. We were very happy. Next slide. This is Joel Pascal. You know, after a, a month at sea, we were uh, just constant repairs, making sure the raft was afloat. Next slide. Joel's a great sailor and a good mechanic and kept things together. And this is our first, uh, our first time being becalmed. So suddenly we get down to the trade winds, about 20 degrees north of the equator, and the raft does an abrupt right turn toward Hawaii. And all of a sudden, we're in this great wind and we're going toward Hawaii and we're just rejoicing and the next day, the wind stops. The wind just cuts off completely. And for five days, we stayed within this 10 mile by 10 mile box, just drifting, going nowhere. All the while, I called Anna to ask for a weather report. And here's what she sent over. Here's the image. Next slide. Off the coast of Cabo San Lucas was the first of three massive hurricanes that formed. And just by sheer luck, we were able to stay about five days ahead of these hurricanes. We would travel five days, and this hurricane, this was Hurricane Fausto. It came and it, it died where we had been five days earlier. And then we moved a couple weeks later, the next hurricane. And it came and died where we had been a week earlier. That happened three times. But each time, the hurricane would give us a lot of good wind and uh, push the raft. Now, these hurricanes are forming off of the coast of Mexico, and they're being driven across the equator uh, by the same currents, the same atmospheric movements that, that create the southern edge of the North Pacific subtropical gyre. And this weather keeps going along the equator, on the north side, until it gets to Japan, and then the, then the wind and the waves kind of go north, and they stay north, come across uh, toward northern California, British Columbia, and then sweep back down south to join these southern currents again. So we, we were riding these currents intentionally, but we were getting later and later in the season, in hurricane season, and we were feeling the wind of these big, big storms. Next slide. So then, because we had so much time, we began trawling for plastics. 
that yellow thing I'm holding is a small sock, fits on a net. We collected maybe I'd say 30 or 40 samples. Every sample had small microplastic particles. The typical microplastics you see of this issue around the world. We were finding lots of microplastics skimming the edge of the North Pacific gyre. Now, after this expedition, Anna and I began the Five Gyres Institute, and we have found, we've done this exact same work using our nets, little net sock. We have found microplastics in every sample we've collected around the globe, over 700 samples in all five subtropical gyres. But this is one of our first. Okay, next slide. As we progressed, two months later, the boat was falling apart. We had the mast was cracking. We had the stays were frayed. The stays are the, uh, the wires that hold the back of the mast. Uh, bottle capture filling with water. So out, we're out of glue. We're out of food. Um, next slide. We were eating everything that that we could. Even little flying fish in the mornings, we would grab those and, and eat them. The one I have here. Next slide. Until we caught that that rainbow runner. Um, this is Joel catching that yellow fish that had the microplastic in its stomach. Actually caught it by hand, not a hook, in a, in a net that he made. And we catch some bigger fish. Next slide. You can see this is one of the big mahi-mahi. Uh, we caught, I think, in total 18 fish in three months. Um, and that was it. Next slide. But then actually what, what saved us was meeting uh, this woman rowing a boat in the middle of the ocean. And it is, it is the craziest story. So Roz Savage is an ocean rower, and I knew she was going to leave San Francisco around the same time that we were leaving Los Angeles. And we talked on the phone, and I said, good luck, good luck, Roz, I'll see you in Hawaii. Two months later, I'm on the phone with Anna, and Anna says, you know that woman Roz Savage in, the, in, that, in that space age canoe rowing by herself? Well, she's 200 miles from you. We couldn't believe it. We're in the middle of nowhere, and here she is, you know, not too far from us, but we had to meet. First of all, she, she was out of water, so it's critical that she gets fresh water. Both her water makers were broken, her, her electric water makers, so we had to meet. But at the same time, my first question to her was, do you have any food? Because we were down to eating fish and peanut butter. So it took us six days to find each other. When we finally did find each other, she, she throws over three bags of food. We made 10 gallons of water. Joel jumped in and found a fish. In fact, the fish in that previous photograph was one that Joel had found. And uh, we had this amazing feast on board this bottle raft. We laughed, took photographs, and two hours later, she was back, back in the boat heading, uh, heading to Hawaii. Next slide. And three weeks later, 800 miles later, we arrived, Joel and I and Roz. Uh, Anna should be in that picture. Uh, next slide. Hawaii. We then took the raft and we traveled uh, up and down the state. We, Anna and I rode bicycles, actually, actually did a whole bicycle tour, giving 42 lectures. And Joel, we met Joel in, in Sacramento at the state capitol in California. Joel brought the raft, and we displayed the raft on the Capitol steps. So you, you've seen the three of us standing there when we met Joel. And at, at the time, Arnold Schwarzenegger was the governor in California, and his office was maybe 100 feet behind us inside the Capitol. And we also had maybe a dozen different environmental NGOs that joined us. I mean, Surfrider, Clean Seas Coalition, uh, Environment California, California's Against Waste. And we all met, I believe, uh, uh, I came, and we all met and talked about the bag ban, the bag ban in California, really pushing the bag ban. This was, you know, 10 years ago, and I, I'm proud to say with this amazing coalition of NGOs across California, it took us 10 years to finally get a statewide plastic bag ban passed in California. And it made the point that, and, and, and the movement understands this, it's slow pressure over time never giving up, constantly fighting this battle. Because I can tell you, it, it, it's a war of attrition. And industry recognizes when they can throw in the towel. And for them, it, it, for industry, it, it, it's a matter of how do they want to spend their time fighting a groundswell of bad PR. 
And, and I know this because I've spoken with uh, representatives of the American Chemistry Council, and they say, you know, like microbeads and the bag bands, we want to focus on other things. So never give up. The slow pressure over time, and we can win. The last slide is the future of, of, of five gyres in this raft. So the future of the raft is, uh, is going to be a future science center committed to sustainability. And Ann and I have begun this now. It's called Leap Lab. And you'll see in Los Angeles, come back to LA in about five years and look for Leap Lab. Look for the Science Center and you'll see the junk rat on display. And hopefully you'll see all around there displays, other exhibits talking about all the wins we have had and how the movement has grown and how the movement of hundreds of organizations is changing how we view waste, how we view plastics. And I, I hope in five years we can, we can all cheer that the culture of single-use throwaway plastics uh, that are polluting our seas has ended. So that's that's all the slides. And here's the book. I got one copy I've got left here in Bali. I wanted to show to show you. There's the raft on the cover. There's Joel. So this book it just came out two months ago, and it's a it, it's a really good update on the science. It talks about and some of the wins along the way about microbeads. Um, the very last chapter is called Revolution by Design. So while we work on some of the policy, um, there's a need for, for innovative minds to create new products, maybe new systems or new ways to deliver products that might not need packaging to, uh, to humanity. So Revolution by Design is the, is the last chapter, and it's where I think this, this movement needs to go. It's, it's, it's both in... In, in pushing hard to get rid of that throwaway culture, but then be mindful and, 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 in, and invite the engineers to join the movement. Invite the, the smart minds to change the systems that can deliver those services and goods to people in different ways. Right, that's an amazing story, Marcus. I mean, that was great. Um, uh, this, um, while, while um, looking at some of the slides, it reminded me of a uh, uh, a research cruise I was on um, in the Gulf of Mexico after the uh, Gulf of Mexico oil spill, um, and uh, we were uh, we were there to uh, monitor the air emissions from you know the oil spill and what kind of impacts it had on the local ecosystem, and um, you know the flying fish and uh, catching mai mai and all of that. I think those are really good experiences. But I think um, I would really recommend anyone watching or. Um, that uh, to have uh, to be on the ocean um, at least once because it's a really um, great opportunity to have a spiritual experience. Um, you know, being on a single small vessel in the middle of you know great forces in the ocean. I think it's it's really humbling and um, um, so yeah, um, really recommend um, a trip like that. I mean, our our research cruise we were you know well s staffed and then we had all the food and water and everything, so we didn't go through you know the difficulties that you had to. But then I think it still was, um, you know, very, uh, a great experience to be on the on the uh, ship and you know be in the middle of the ocean. Um, so, um, so Marcus, uh, tell us about uh, a little bit more about you know the the last chapter in the book. And um, you said it was an update on science. So, and I'm sure you've spent a lot of time thinking about you know all of this while writing and also while doing the voyage. So, tell us a little bit about you know the update on science and the last chapter that you have. So the, the update on science, you know, we're looking at you know, this, some of the, the human health stuff that's coming out, um, but also looking at the ecological impacts. And that's where I think there's, there's a lot of work that's being done. I think the frontier uh, of the science is not as much as saying, you know, there is plastic on this beach, plastic on that beach. And a few papers still trickle out reporting you know, abundances of waste. And that's good to have. I think the, the most important information we should look at are some of the ecological impacts on whole populations. And but that's very difficult. It's hard to put an entire species, an entire population of, uh, of, of, of one vertebrate species in a test tube. It's really hard to make those observations. But it has been done. There's one great paper that was uh, done on oysters, finding that the, the abundance of microfibers in their bodies and the POPs associated with them were causing some, some, some degree of population decline. Uh, their population sizes were, were, were smaller. That, that is where the real harm is. That's, that's I was, not, not the real harm. That's where some of the biggest harm can be. 
So if a paper describes, here's another fish with a bottle cap inside, or here's a, a turtle ate a bag, those are, are, are horrible things to, to witness, but they don't, they, they don't give you an idea of the harm against the whole population. When you show that, then we can see. I think then you can bring in um, some other uh, policy tools, um, Endangered Species Act, and uh, there are other things that you can do to look at when an entire population is affected. So the frontier is there. There's, there's a need for the science in, in that realm. Also, human health. There is, a, uh, there is talk now about you know, smallest, small particles, nanoparticles crossing the, the, the blood-brain barrier or getting into our blood system and the effect it might have at a subcellular level. So I think some of the human health and the ecological population uh, impacts is, is where the science, the science is now. That's the front line. All right, great. And um, also um, talking about the um, um, collective action. I mean, this theme is about collective action. How you know all of us could you know work together to turn the tide. And um, your book, uh, you do discuss about the rising activism, a uh, tide of activism um, against plastic pollution. So. And uh, earlier you mentioned about, you know, um, working towards a bad ban in California. So, you know, considering all of this, um, do you think you started a movement in California which could then act as an example um, to other states to, you know, do something similar? Because in, in, in the U.S., you know, that, that, is, uh, that, that is how the system kind of works to some extent. You know, if there is a state which already does this, then it's much easier for other states to do it too. So um, can you talk a little bit about that aspect of, you know, scaling the movement or um, doing the back ban uh, across, across the United States to begin with? Yes, I think, uh, uh, I think certainly there are lessons you can learn, not just from California, but from other countries. Kenya, for example, we know they just banned plastic bags across the country. We're seeing, you know, other, uh, other instances of EPR legislation happening in, in Chile as a good example where it holds brands responsible to get back uh, uh, their packaging. So I think, look at these examples. There, uh, I do have some colleagues who are working on a, uh, uh, a site where you can go and see all these examples, really spelled out well, so that with any, whichever country or community you're from, you can look and say, okay, I wanna do a, a, a product ban. Okay, here's a community that did it, and here's how they did it, here are ex actually examples of the policy briefs that they used, images, here are the videos, here are the, the media tools, here's the strategy. So uh, I think having a clearinghouse and then a college working on this, we can all go to find these strategies. So in California, for example, our, our bag ban, as I mentioned, was a 10-year effort from you know, dozens of NGOs uh, and individuals and, and, uh, and politicians all working in the same direction over time, a long time, 10 years, to make it happen. Microbeads, I mean, how that happened, it's, it's in my book, you know, step by step from the science happening. The science came after microbeads was already being, being looked at in Europe. There were already, uh, the Plastic Soup Foundation had some amazing tools that they, they had created uh, to bring awareness to microbeads. And myself and Sam Mason from SUNY Fredonia, uh, an awesome scientist, she and I, we found the microbeads in the Great Lakes, published that paper. We had the science. We had precedent in Europe using what they were doing successfully and launched a campaign in the United States with an amazing coalition of people, the story of stuff. Um, I mean, the list is, is long, and we won. Um, uh, within you know, three years of the, the, of the pub paper being published in the U.S., we had signing the legislation. So that's the policy side. Then the innovation side, there's a lot of amazing, amazing new, new ways of moving materials or, or providing services. I know here in, in Los Angeles, where I live, uh, there's a group called WeTap. They just got a, a, a big chunk of change to bring uh, refilling stations to schools. So I, I know when I was a kid, I grew up, there were water fountains in, in all of the schools. And then they, they became water bottles and now they're getting back to water fountains. Water fountains with the bottle refilling station. So, so yeah, I think um, um, 
look soon for a clearinghouse for all these policy tools and these other other interventions and mitigations. Now it's coming soon. Uh, it's a chance for everyone to plug in and share their success. Right, and um, so you're saying it's coming soon. So um, it's not. Um, is there a link that everyone can go to, or is will that be announced in the future too? In the future. Okay. Okay. All right. Wonderful. Great. Um, and um, so, uh, so, uh, and um, could we go back to the um, the conference um, that you've just been? So you're done with the conference, and you're coming back. So you know, what are your final thoughts? What are your future plans? Um, are you going to write another book um, sometime in the future, or you know, what are you going? Are you going to focus on the Leap Lab? If you are, you know, tell us a little bit about Leap Lab and what you plan to do there. Sure, sure. So, so in the future, um, is actually right now we're working on Leap Lab, and that is a science center committed to sustainability and urban resilience. It's focused on. Uh, it's a demonstration space for urban resilience. It, it's, it's waste issues, but it's also energy uh, production, food and water security, ecology, community. Those, those are the five themes. But bringing all of, all of our knowledge and experience on plastics into that waste theme. Um, the previous speaker talked about, uh, previous two speakers, about zero waste. That's the movement. It's about zero wasting our, our communities, building circular economies. So Leap Lab will be a science center that will show, at least our city here in LA, what a resilient city, what a zero waste certain economy looks like. And actually show people how to do it in a practical, economically feasible way. So that's that's where our focus is. The right. Lab. At the same time, Five Gyres is still doing you know amazing work. We have expeditions coming up, and we'll actually be in Indonesia next week working on this. This is a hot spot where I'm at right now. And in this region, um, you, you, there's an effort to monitor uh, closely how much trash leaves land, how much is in the oceans, where it's coming from, going upstream. And if we can monitor and, and detect reductions in river outputs over time, find out what was the mitigation upstream that worked and scale that around the, uh, around the area. Right. And um, I'm going to be at the International Solid Waste Association Congress and um, it's also WasteCon. Waste Conference is by SWANA, which is the Solid Waste Authority, the so Solid Waste Association of North America. So they're together organizing a conference in Baltimore uh, this 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 month. So um, they're they're uh, planning to present um, uh, findings from their research on how uh, what role or the potential of uh, improving waste management systems in these countries uh, to reduce marine plastic litter. So I think um, it'll be. Uh, are you planning to attend uh, one of those sessions, or um... I will not. I will not be there. I got so much traveling coming up. Actually, I, I leave Bali and then I head to Paris for a, a microplastics workshop. But there, oh, there's wow. great work. It's it's pretty amazing to see how this movement has grown internationally. The science has embraced. I mean, marine debris uh, plus pollution science is kind of filled its own now. Using de degree programs, universities, it's. It's amazing to see this move and how it's grown. Hey, uh, Ranjith, I'm going to have to head to the airport. <laughs> no worries, uh, uh, Marcus, we're done. So um, great. Thank you very much for your time and uh, have a safe uh, flight back. My pleasure. Thank you so much. Have a good one. See you. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Um, friends, so um, that was uh, Marcus Erickson. Uh, he spoke to us from an airport in Bali, Indonesia, which is why we had um, some uh, background noise. But otherwise, uh, I, I thought that was a, a very good session. We learned a lot from his experience on the boat and uh, on the on the junk raft. So um, finally, friends, so uh, tomorrow we have uh, another session on practicing uh, waste management. And um, we have um, Mani, uh, Mani Kishore from um, Banyan Nation. He'll be talking about uh, how entrepreneurs could work with informal recyclers. And uh, we also have um, uh, uh, Kirsty Pecky uh, from, uh, uh, from Conservation Law Foundation. And she'll be talking about what kind of uh, information we should know about regulations and legislations um about and compliance of uh, our uh, local waste handling facilities 
And uh, we also have other great panels. So um, I uh, welcome you to uh, register for that session too and um, follow us tomorrow. So thank you very much again. And um, have a good day, good night, and good evening, uh, wherever you are in the world. Uh, and also uh, follow us on um, social media and subscribe to our newsletter to stay updated. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.